Welcome aboard the AM show. It's Tuesday. It's raining. <laughs> if in case you hadn't noticed, if you're still in bed or you're just rousing yourself out, it's pouring out there. Let me know what the situation is in your neighborhood. But for us, we're right here doing what we do best. My name is Sweetie Abachi, and he is. <laughs> and I'm Benjamin Akakwa. I've missed the rain. I've been in, in the building for a while, so I was surprised yeah. that when yeah. I was coming in, it didn't seem, there was no indication at all that Trust me, it was going to rain. it's been in different places. That's the second time this month it does happen. Yes. Yeah. Talk but about, I think the first time yeah. it, it started after we had started the show. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yeah. So it's catching us unawares yeah. in the mornings. But showers of blessings. We're glad that you've taken the time to join us this morning. What can you expect on the show? Let's start with you. Well, start with me because I'll be bringing you the news. And after that, we get into the news review. Financial analyst Dr. Wisdom Dogbe will be joining us for the news review. And after that, Muftar Nabila Abdullahi will bring you all the latest chronicles in the world of sports. After that, we get into our big stories. Benjamin, what's happening? Handing over the baton to me. And of course, uh, first off the chopping board, we'll be looking at the Tema Newtown shooting incident, which is among several occurrences that continue to threaten the peaceful coexistence between the public and the security agencies. We've had a number of those. Now, the April 12 incident that witnessed the raging conflict between the youth of Tema, Newtown to be specific, and the Eastern Naval Command has sent the community uh, or left the community in grief as they mourn the death of two of their own. And uh, the Youth Association is demanding a national probe. Now, what solutions are on the table in terms of curbing this phenomenon of incessant shootings uh, that jeopardize the stability of the state? We find out from our guests this morning. Stay with us for that. Also, court issues warrant for the arrest of the head of the criminal investigations and head of legal department of the Ghana Police Service over contempt of court. Judge says no one is above the law. Now, will this directive be executed by the Inspector General of Police? What does this mean for the rule of law of our country? We will interrogate this, so you want to stay with us for the second belt of our conversations. But of course, I'm invite, we are inviting you to join us with your thoughts, your comments, either via phone or on all our social media platforms. We are your hosts, Sweetie Abochi and... Benjamin Akako. I yeah. eagerly wait to see. You know, yeah. I love it when the law is tested. Yeah. And so in this case, right, will he be arrested? Will, will she, right, be arrested? What yeah. is going to be the situation with the CID boss for contempt of court? I always like to test uh, the waters in that regard yeah. and find out how the law would react. Because guess what? No matter who you are, mm. per our constitution, the law may give you some leverage, but mm. right up to the president, Obia and Obia. Rule and of law. if you law. fall foul of the law, it the law must with take you. its course. Yeah. So I'm waiting to see how that pans out. Well, let's get into it then. Starting with the news. Let's go. Thanks for tuning in. This is the AM News, the first news bulletin on the Joy News channel. Let's begin with the 120-bed capacity Setra Kumewu District Hospital in the Ashanti region is finally open for public use after a 10-year wait. Residents are excited. They can now access health care at the facility after contractors M&M's Infrastructure Limited handed it over to health authorities. My colleague Oheming Tewia, however, reports all departments, beginning first with the maternity unit and administration, will start operations ahead of official commissioning. Construction works on the 120-bed capacity Setra Kumawu District Hospital, a 10 project, started in 2014. Despite the project suffering undue delays due to funding constraints and re variations that altered construction schedules, contractors delivered a world-class standard health facility. <laughs> MMS Infrastructure Limited was involved in the design, construction and equipment of the new hospital, which will serve as Antimampo, Insuta, Biposo, Kwamai and its environs, as well as their front place, Kumau and Efidrasi areas. Deputy Director of Health Services in charge of administration, Ashanti, Michael Asaribidiakou announced all departments at the old polyclinic will be transferred to the new facility at the end of next month. Tomorrow, 
the hospital administration, the uh, maternity wing of the polyclinic, they are moving in to start operations. And we've given ourselves up to the end of next month so that all the units at the old polyclinic would have moved in to this place. This handover ceremony marks the end of several years of waiting by residents of Sechirikumbu and its environs, who until now were forced to assess health care from an improvised polyclinic. It comes as health authorities battle the maternal mortality rate, which stands at 125 per 100,000 life births. Here is an elated medical superintendent of the Kumau Polyclinic, Dr. Alex Agbanu, who says residents have likened the new district hospital to a hotel due to its state-of-the-art installations. We've been looking forward to this for a very long time, and I'm happy that today all of us are seeing what we are seeing. This it's is a wonderful, wonderful environment. environment. I, mean, I mean, people come here and they wonder, is it a hospital or a hotel? Well, it's a hospital, as I said. Uh, there's a fully-fledged herbal medicine unit, uh, and then uh, we also have... Um, you have the medical unit, pediatric unit with um, incubators. We have a very nice emergency with ventilatory supports. We have a uh, dental unit. The list goes on and on. I wonderful equipment there and all. You go to the wards. There are monitors there to monitor patients. And a, a whole lot. I mean, uh, you go to the theater. Wonderful. The maternal mortality issues uh, has not been too different from uh, I mean what pertains uh, nationally and even in the region uh, and because we did not have the necessary equipment what happens is sometimes we do refer some of the cases that we don't have the capacity to manage but I think with uh, this new facility with all the equipment that it has and the personnel that are coming in so we'll be able to manage most of the cases. Among those who have sighed a relief are the staff of the infrastructure directorate of the Ministry of Health. Their unrelenting efforts have paid off as the hospital is operationalized. Kwame Amponsan Safo is head of Capital Investment and Project Management Unit, Ministry of Health. I'm full of relief, and I believe everybody, including my director, is full of relief. Um, why do I say so? At some point, we're even someone to the chief palace to you know, answer questions as to why the project was not moving on. And so for it to have come to fruition today, um, it's all good news for us, and we are really happy that we have this project here. The specialness of the project starts from the planning, you understand, how you package the project. So as you know, this is a fully equipped 120 bed district hospital, and that is special in itself. I mean, you come in here, um, all the equipment that you need for proper health care uh, are here. Miwa, director of NMS Infrastructure Limited, Stephen Bush, says his company is poised to deliver a more world-class health infrastructure project in Ghana. We hope to be involved continually in the health, pro health program here. Um, we, the original uh, idea was for her here, to be here for the long term, and that is still our commitment. From Kumau in the Ashanti region for Joy News, Oim Interior reporting. From health, let's get into the agricultural sector, Food Sovereignty Ghana and the Peasants Farmers Association are urging Ghanaians to resist the government's decision to approve GMO seeds in Ghana. They cite potential health implications and economic risks. They insist that GMOs threaten the country's agriculture. The two groups want government to reverse its decision. There is more in this report by Zuleha Nuhu and Cordial. Read to you. Recently, the Ghana National Biosafety Authority, NBA, approved the commercial use of 14 genetically modified products, including eight maize and six soybean varieties. It clarified in a statement that it has not approved the seeds of 14 genetically modified GM products to be cultivated in Ghana, but only registered 14 GM products to be imported into the country. At a press conference here in Accra, Food Sovereignty Ghana and the Peasant Farmers Association urged Ghanaians to kick against government's decision to approve GMO seeds in Ghana. 
They cite potential health implications and economic risk. Here is Program Officer of the Present Farmers Association, Bismarck Owusu-Norte. He says GMOs threaten the country's agriculture and calls for the government to reverse its decision. The issue of GMOs is a very complex issue. Uh, globally, there is no worldwide acceptance about the safety of GMOs. And it should be of major concern to everyone, including those of us in Ghana here. Uh, for a product that has very strict guidelines, strict regulations, a product that is existence is due to a lot of genetic modification should be of, of, of much concern to all of us. Now, if you look at countries where uh, GMOs uh, were introduced, and you look at its effects on both the safety and even the incomes of farmers, uh, it doesn't paint a good picture for GMOs and its acceptance in Ghana here. Communications Director of Food Sovereignty Ghana, Edwin Bafour says, Authorities must recognize that most Ghanaians are not fully aware of the implications of GMOs and that introducing them into our agricultural system is the last thing we need. 90-something percent of people have no clue what GMO is. That means you have no right as a regulator to be coming to change their food. That means you're really more of an agent for the foreign companies. And if you look at the names on the applicants, for the licenses to bring in these GM products. It's Bayer, Monsanto, Syngenta. These companies are not even allowed to grow GMOs in their own country. But is it true that most Ghanaians are not fully aware of genetically modified food product, hence the need not to introduce it into Ghana's agricultural system? We went to the market to find out from the sellers what they know about it. This is the Niamana Wadiya Drew. Uh, come on, it's too much because at the end of the day, nobody will say, yeah, 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 we are dying because of those things. Now, if you buy even food in the market, those spices and those things, we are sick. You see some of our neighbors, they will say the person has get cancer. The person has get those things. So we beg the farmers and the scientists. They should try and give us natural things, please. We beg them because of our health, so we want to grow. So they should help us. Yendi, a local winner. Oh, now I have to say, if you ask us why you're what I say, did you panel come for me? I don't know about GMOs. All I suggest is that we eat our local foods. I personally prefer the natural foods because my children also consume it. Now, amidst the vibrant business ongoing in the to-do markets, the streets are strewn with rubbish. As plastic bags and wrappers dance like confetti in the market, it is clear that to-do market hygiene is a cause for concern. But who will shoulder this responsibility for this? Mamie Sinja Michelle Thompson was there for today's episode of Filth Exhibition. The to-do market is a buzz with activity. Traders are alert as hawks, seeking to divert shoppers' attention to their wares. On the other side are money changers prowling the streets, looking out for those willing to change their foreign currencies. It is simply another day to make profit. But in the midst of all the chaos, laced on every corner and in front of the stalls, is the rubbish walk of fame. Bags of filth littered everywhere on the major street. On the side of the road, on the major road, in the to-do market is this bag of trash, mainly made up of plastics, bottles, and takeaway packs. What is interesting is everybody is going past it and concerned. The market's hygiene has become a cause for concern, but who will take responsibility? It is the junkies that spill the rubbish on the streets. Those junkies are responsible. 
The store owners are responsible for the fields in the market. What they do is, at the end of business, they push all their rubbish out on the streets. Even though traders indicate the presence of a few trash cans and payment to the rubbish collectors to collect the filth, these are not the solution to the major loitering in the area. People continue to litter on the streets instead of putting it in the trash cans. Oh, I'm not paying the other problem. I think I'm not paying the other one. 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 When they sweep, there is no dustbin to collect the rubbish. That is why it is littered all over. We need dustbins here to take the rubbish. If there was a bigger container collecting all the rubbish, there wouldn't be this much food. Well, until city authorities enforce sanitation bylaws, the plastic bags and wrappers will continue to be scattered about like confetti, posing a threat to the environment and the health of people in the market. Until the next episode, this is Mami Sinyamiche Thompson for Filth Exhibition. That's our latest episode on a joint new series, Filth Exhibition. Now moving on, commercial drivers in Ashanti region say they are earnestly awaiting official communication for new transport fares, the previous week saw confusion at lorry stations as some drivers applied a 20% fare increase. But the drivers shelved the decision after GPRTU and the uh, Road Transport Coordinating Council called on them to reverse the price adjustment. Some drivers in Kumasi say with a high cost of fuel, there should be no further delays in announcing new fares. America clearly concerned for the two just ever two by 30%. And no crowd mukano from Friday. Yes, you any more increment in Amma. And we all must anchor and say, I'm going to be a bit too, a bit too much. The Concerned Drivers Association announced some new fares the other time, but nothing happened. We don't know if they will affect the new prices. We are eagerly waiting because times are hard. I'm going to say, somewhere you. Run up a finny, I come in. Where is this? What is this? This is the same. We are really suffering. There is always a banter between drivers and passengers when the new price is announced. If the government could reduce the cost of fuel, it would help. The fuel is now expensive and I'm unable to make enough profit. I had to buy 400 cities out of 600 cities I made and paid the car owner. The University of Cape Coast has conferred an honorary doctorate award to the Omahin of Ugua traditional area, Osabere Marquisiata II. The university says the award of Osabere Marquisiata II is in recognition of his contribution to the growth and development of the university. There's more in this report. The Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Dr. Sir Sam Jonah, expressed his delight in the university's decision to award Osabre Makwesiata II. The establishment of our university on lands that include those of the Ogwa tradition area has been both beneficial and lately challenging. I commend the forbearance 
and the management of the challenges by Osabarima and its predecessors, which have prevented potential conflicts. And in this regard, I support the ongoing efforts led by Professor Amonu Kofi and others to address these issues collaboratively. Osabarima's love for Cape Coast, his contributions to the university, his role in promoting regional unity and peace, and his advocacy for local development make him an exemplary honorary. Indeed, this honor is long overdue. Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Johnson Yakubu Ampon, says the contribution of the chief has paid the university on to greater heights and thus deserves the recognition. The University of Cape Coast has a rich tradition of recognizing excellence and achievement and has in the past awarded honorary degrees to distinguished individuals, many of whom have contributed significantly to the advancement of society. What makes today's award ceremony significant, however, is the fact that it is the first time the university community is publicly acknowledging the contribution of our landlord, or Sabari Marquesi Atta, or Mahen Okogwa traditional area. Accepting the award, Osabre Makuisiata II thanked the university for the honor done him and pledged his commitment to the university. This problem between the university and the villages, we have already started, and I'm told the preliminary report is nearly finished. Hopefully, within the next week or so, we will sit down and see how it, it will go. But I want to assure you that I will spend all the time available to me to make sure that whatever it is that is bothering the smooth teaching and the peaceful existence of this uh, institution, I will do whatever I have to do to make sure. Principal members of the university robed Osabere Makwesiata II and thanked him for his unflinching service. And now to our final story for this bulletin, former power minister Dr. Kwabena Donko says the relocation of the Ameri power plant in Aomaso in Kumasi vindicates the as well John Mahama administration. The plant was part of some emergency purchase agreement signed by the as well NDC government to mitigate the Doomsaw crisis in 2015. The, the NPP then in opposition and some experts at the time criticized government over the deal, describing it as a knee-jerk approach to resolving the power crisis. The Volta River Authority has now moved the plant to Kumase in a bid to stabilize the erratic power supply from the Ashanti to the northern part of the region. Reacting to the new development, Dr. Kwabna Donko said the move absorbs the NDC of all criticisms. I don't have a problem with um, the new nomenclature except that the public should be told, there should be recognition that this is the Ameri plant being relocated. That is so important, so that the impression is not created in the minds of Ghanaians that this is a new plant. And for me, it absorbs some of us, especially those of us whose homes were raided because of this Ameri plant in 20. 17. It absorbs us because one of the arguments we made when we're bringing in the plant under President John Ramani Mahama was that because of its modular nature, it could be moved from place to place in the country to meet emerging needs in particular localities. And so this is the fulfillment of what we had envisaged, that yes, because of the modular nature, there are 10 units, each with 25 megawatt capacity. We can move them around to meet national demand. And let's also be fair, the decision to have generation in the central corridor is not an MPP decision. It's been something that has been on the drawing board, just as there's a, uh, the need for another box supply point. 
And that's it for the AM News. Up next is the News Review. Dr. Wizon Kofi Dogbe um, joins us for the News Review. Join us. I don't know why this morning I've remembered the Fanti Confederation. Maybe it's something uh, the director whispered into our mm. ears. He okay. said something right before we came on, and it reminded yeah. me of mm. the Fanti Conf Confederation. Anyway, here we are. Time now for the news yeah. review. Is there a different look about you this morning? Is there? I'm asking, is there? I don't know. You're watching me. Is it the... Oh, I'm watching you. Huh? Is, it, is it the way your hair has been fixed? Or yeah. is it, uh, yeah, is it the angle of the... I'm, I'm trying, okay, you know. okay. We'll find out <laughs> at some point. Anyway, uh, here we are. Right before we get into the news review, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us to bring you this segment every weekday. And today is uh, just one of those other days as well. And here's what they're offering you if you are a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free. Now, make your way to any of their branches. Uh, here in Accra, they had Spintex offers of the Shell signboard. Kumase, Kronoma Boy here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takwa De Anaji State, there's Tema Community 22, there's Techiman Hanswa, and I see Amanzama. Their call lines 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 3. End Point Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. Joining us for the news review, we have uh, Dr. Wisdom Dogbe. He is a financial analyst and he joins the conversation. Doc, good morning. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Indeed, city really looks different, right? Pardon me. <laughs> what? It must be my birthday. Sweetie looks different. Because <laughs> I don't know what Sweetie it is. looks different. Aha! Because I, I could also notice something. Something was, you know. Well, so I'm not the only person, right? You have company with that one. Uh -huh, because you, I could tell there was something. There was something. I don't know whether it's the hair or something. But I'm, a, I'm just about to well, become rich. That's all. Oh. It's, it's starting to smell on me. A that, that, that's interesting. I thought you were, you were Please, wealthy no, not, already. Not, wealthy not even rich. Yet. Wealthy. Not yet. But not I'm, yet. I'm working my way towards it. You know? so, yeah. what, what, what you just said, though, reminds me of something. An old interview with yeah. um, Robert Nesta Marley. Okay. Bob Marley. Okay. And the interviewer. And with you. Or no, no, not okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, I my... <laughs> but and I know that that sounded confusing, yeah. right? Okay. And the interviewer, um, you know, asks him, "What do you consider?" In... So he's talking about they are talking about wealth and all of that, and he asks Bob Marley about riches, mm -hmm. and Bob Marley retorts, throws it back to him, "What do you consider riches?" And then you know, there's a talk about it, yeah. and then he talks about what he considers to be wealth okay. or riches okay. and it had nothing to do with money money yeah because i know people who are wealthy i mean people say that and sometimes people think it's not that it's bad to have money it's not bad to have money but there are people who are wealthy who don't have friends who don't have people around Lonely. them who don't have who are not happy yeah. who are not joyful so money definitely it's a good thing but it's not everything Anyway, uh -huh. I but, strive for abundance, you know. Oh, yeah. Not just, you know, financial, but people, family, experiences, exactly. things exactly. that make my eyes come alive. But let's get into the newspapers this morning <laughs> because this is the newspaper <laughs> review session. Oh, and, well. um, do you want Dr. Um, Dogbe to do that one minute um, review on any topical issue before we get into the newspapers? I, th I think we should. Okay. We should let him do that. And okay. then uh, we'll get into the rest of it. So, Dr. Dogbe, over to you. What's been Perfect. on your mind? Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I read a news article about the um, oil refinery bringing in a new board and stuff like that. And I just want to comment a bit on this, though I still need to do a, a bit more research here. I think that we need to leverage our visionary leadership in the nation to help plan on how we can deploy our natural resources and national assets, get the most out of them for the nation, and leverage that for optimal economic uh, development. Thor has been bleeding for years now, and I believe uh, it is 
as a result of mismanagement and also strategies that don't align well with the current demands of the market. Why did we not get uh, central investors to rather invest in and also revitalize Tor? This mandate is the same as central, right, I believe. Uh, and I'm talking about a new Chinese refinery. And Tor hasn't been operating at full capacity. So why establish a new refinery when the current one is not even operating at full capacity? I'm personally skeptical, right, uh, of the impact of any new board uh, at Tor. What needs to change there is not only the board, but the overall strategy of running the shop. We need a mindset change, a new way of thinking with a focus on finding a better or optimal way to leverage you know, the refinery, make it profitable, which will expand the revenue base of the nation, uh, and also reduce unemployment uh, through job creation and diversify the economy. Has enough been done in research and development, right, to explore uh, new and state-of-the-art cost-effective uh, technologies for refining crude. And I also think that it could require some form of PPP, right, public-private uh, partnership. Government currently owns store 100% from what I heard. What would, it, would it make sense, right, if you think about it, to explore full or partial uh, privatization, right? It is becoming clearer and clearer that government is not always uh, the best at managing these types of businesses uh, in the country. So uh, I think it will make some more sense if we consider some form of uh, private partnership in Tor to help turn things around. Yes, I, I mean, I can agree with you, Doc. But let's get to the newspaper, starting with the Daily Guide newspaper. On the front page, it says, President launches national service policy. No new taxes, Finance Minister Shaw's. Arrest drivers charging illegal fares. NACOC staff arrested over cocaine smuggling. On December polls, Mahama promises military barracks in new regions. I'll start with the story of no taxes. The finance minister, it's on page three of the Daily Guide. The finance minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, has indicated that the government has no plans of introducing new taxes in its revenue mobilization efforts. According to him, instead of overburdening Ghanaians with the payment of more taxes, the government is determined to ensure effective tax collection while minimizing tax evasion. The sector minister made this known after the country reached a staff-level agreement with the International Monetary Fund on its extended credit facility arrangement over the weekend. I'll add two more stories and then we come for your reactions, Doc, so that we can um, sum it up. President launches national service policy. So, President Ekufuado yesterday outdoored a new national service policy to give the service a new focus and direction. The 10-year policy spanning the period between 2024 to 2034 is intended to channel the energies of service personnel towards national development goals. It aims to provide a structured framework for directing resources and efforts towards maximizing state interest and aligning with aspirations of service personnel. I don't know how this is different from what we're already doing. But my last story, NACOC staff arrested over cocaine smuggling. A female staff uh, of the Narcotics Control Commission stationed at the Kotoka International Airport has been arrested in connection with the alleged interception of a significant quantity of illegal drugs at Brussels Airport in Belgium. Sources indicate that the suspect, a Dutch national, Preja Delge Bianca, was found to have concealed the cocaine around her waist ingeniously disguised as undergarment and used adhesive tape to secure the drugs down to her ties uh, and buttocks. This story has been in the, in the news for some time and KIA you know, came out with the press statement and uh, assured people that their security is uh, not to be something they should worry about. <coughs> but Dr. <coughs> Dogby, what are your thoughts on these three stories? Surely, thank you. Um, I think that as far as the National Service uh, Scheme new policy is concerned, I think this is a step in the right direction if it is different from what is going on today. Mm. You know, I think that the National Service Scheme has always been about mobilizing and sending out uh, young talents to serve in various sectors of the economy. And if this policy framework transforms uh, uh, the scheme into a more rounded capacity building and empowerment sector, that should be a welcoming news. Now, our education system sometimes trains us to pass exams 
and not necessarily uh, to be ready for the realities in the workplace. And this is what the National Service Scheme can augment that effort instead of merely mobilizing and deploying uh, graduates, who sometimes sit idle because there's no much for them to do at some of their posting units or companies. The scheme itself is very important and it plays a, a, a substantial role, right, in the nation's development and uh, societal cohesion. And it's because of this importance, I mean, that is why we should have a solid uh, policy framework to get the best out of the scheme for graduates and for the nation as a whole. And Sweetie, if you think about it, mm. our national service scheme fosters a sense of national uh, identity. Mm. Folks with diverse backgrounds from different regions of the country, they are posted sometimes to different locations. They meet new people, they start uh, learning about things like work ethics, uh, shared responsibility, and also national pride. And uh, the service also brings graduates from different socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, ethnicities, and religions together. By working and even sometimes living together, uh, these graduates learn to appreciate and understand each other's perspectives, breaking down barriers and promoting uh, social cohesion and integration. And this helps to build a more inclusive and, and a harmonious uh, society. And I think that a new policy could augment this further mm. uh, to build that capacity for the nation. One of the things that I got from my national service was a sense of civic responsibility and being an active Ghanaian contributing my quota uh, right after school. Mm -hmm. It just instills a sense of that civ civic responsibility and also encourages active participation in national development. And so I believe a structured policy framework mm. could make the scheme even much more impactful. That is if it is rolled out and managed uh, properly. Right. And so of, uh, as we learn valuable skills, right, during our national service programs. So there is often uh, training and also skill development opportunities. Mm. And so I believe if we implement a well thought out policy framework, you know, to boost the benefits of the scheme, it could be a win-win situation for the nation and also for the graduates. Okay. I'll do some final headlines in the Daily Guide and then move on to the Daily Statement. Ghana's economy performing better than forecast. That is according to the IMF. Um, don't vote for Mahama, says Nicolas Omanie Champong. <laughs> okay. ME Africa Expo to boost business visibility. Tenants jailed for horrific attack. And work begins on Takrade Agonankwanta roads those are some stories in the daily guide newspaper to the daily statement on the front page it says new dawn in national service that's a story that you just touched on president launches policy for 2024 to 2034 uh, on the national service scheme ghana secures interim debt relief deal with bondholders peace campaign strategy for 2024 elections unveiled Bank of Ghana governor expects IMF $360 million to bolster Ghana's foreign reserves. I'll touch on that story briefly on um, page six of the Daily Statement, and then Dr. Lugbe can come in, and then Benjamin takes over. So the story reads, the governor of Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, has expressed confidence about Ghana's foreign currency reserves becoming stronger the disbursement of a third tranche, or that is the $360 million from the International Monetary Fund, during a joint IMF, BOG, and Ministry of Finance press briefing, that's on Saturday in Accra, of the staff level agreement on Ghana's second review of the three extended credits facility, Dr. Addison said he was optimistic about the board's approval in June. Um, performance tracker and indigenous initiative, that story is on page seven. We've gone into this story of performance tracker throughout last week. Richard Ahyangba, Director of Communications of the NPP, has described the government's performance tracker as a groundbreaking initiative. He asserted that no previous government had ever implemented such a measure. The tracker was launched on Wednesday, April. It just gives details about um, the tracker. So there you have it. Those are some stories in the Daily Statesman. Dr. Dugbe, uh, oh, ben, ben, okay. maybe before Doc comes in, yeah. and I'm sure Dr. Dugbe just might be curious. Yeah. There are certain things that the president missed out on in his sonar yeah. that I was expecting to hear more of okay. in, uh, as far as the performance tracker is concerned. Yeah. I mean, one of the crucial areas touted by this administration before coming to power in 2017 yeah. uh, via election 2016 was corruption. Right. Where's corruption in the performance tracker? 
and and ah. again, uh, yes, I, I mean it was just for projects. It, indeed, but th there have been what would you call it? Uh, institutions set yes, up and yes, all of that. Yes. Where, okay. where is the report on those crucial areas to point to how corruption has been dealt yeah. with? The linkages. And some have mentioned, and I agree, the National Cathedral. It's a major, major project. People sometimes think that when they talk about the National Cathedral, I've espoused my thoughts on that and felt that I felt at this point it was unnecessary. But people have built cathedrals over time, mm. uh, the French, others. So, yes, we could have maintained it, but what was the quid pro quo? What were we getting for it? And we've, in, we've sunk in there taxpayers' money. Mm. Where's the report on that? Question for the girls. <laughs> so some of the things, apart yeah. from, I mean, since we're talking about omissions mm. and all of that, yeah. in, I mean, my school was, there was something in there about my school which, which hadn't, you know, so all of those things, yes. But mm. we spoke about Agenda 111 and two of the hospitals were not even existent and there. Even the, one district the facts and the team. figures were not adding up. But, but these are crucial areas. And, mm. and I think it's not a bad thing, really. A performance tracker. You know, uh, under the Obama administration, they had what they called the Obameter. Yes. A meter or a metric measuring president, former president yes. Barack Hussein yes. Obama and what he had done, what he had not. I mean, those things are good, but let's not make it cosm simply cosmetic or propagandist. Let's focus on something, in fact, something that can stand the test of time so that right. every administration that comes, for example, we can hold them to those same metrics rather than just something that is fluff, that is for, you know, and, and that doesn't serve any purpose. We end up spending more taxpayers' money mm. to keep up some of these things that really don't do anything. Right. I mean, Ben, this isn't the first time they're launching some sort of tracker for a manifesto. But, Dr. Dobie, what are this, your thoughts? This is an upgrade on the... There was yeah, something yeah, the they manifesto had, tracker. I think delivery um, tracker or something of the sort. Mm, they, they, they had the delivery tracker. Yes. For the, yeah. And they, they say that it's specifically for it's the It's an upgrade manifesto. of the delivery but tracker. But the projects that you're implementing, are, you know, came from your manifesto. So how does that reconcile? Dr. Yeah. Dobie... <laughs> You know, Ben took the words out of my mouth, yeah. right? A performance tracker without uh, uh, corruption metrics, that is a joke. It's not a performance tracker, in my opinion, right? It has to be all-encompassing, so you can say it's measuring every aspect of how government performs. And so with that said, I would digress. I would swap that and go to uh, the 360 million that we mm. receive. You know, as far as our debt situation is concerned, right, I, I think the fact remains that we're making progress, right? But we've also seen some snags here and there, at least in the short term. But I think that Ghana remains in crisis in the long haul, right? And it will take a while to fix, even for the next administration. So I, I tend to agree with His Excellency President Akufuado when he said some time ago that Ghana needs to find a good balance between meeting the expectations of Ghanaians and at the same time committing to the condi conditionalities of the uh, IMF's mm. three-year extended credit program. The IMF chief uh, for Ghana, Stefan Rudet, uh, said that our performance has been stronger under the IMF back program with the uh, most quantitative targets met. And he also mentioned that monetary policy has remained under tight uh, control, uh, which has helped to reduce inflationary pressures rapidly. I must admit that I will need to catch up on some of these metrics, mm -hmm. but I will say that all of these sound quite well However, it doesn't seem to reflect on uh, the economic situation on the average Guinean, at least at this time. And again, I'll need to catch up on uh, the latest and the greatest uh, on the specific requirements. But the more I think about how we got here, I ask myself the question, how can we properly manage the debt level of the nation to avoid uh, this disaster in the near future? And in my opinion, one approach is through continuous uh, fiscal discipline. On the fiscal front, uh, Sweetie, IMF mentioned that we're on track to achieve a fiscal uh, primary surplus of about uh, half a percent, percentage point of GDP mm. in uh, 2024. And that spending has remained, uh, they mentioned that spending has remained within uh, budgetary limits. Again, all of this good stuff, we have to ensure or uh, maintain that kind of a fiscal discipline by ensuring that the government is uh, spending sustainably. But I worry that old habits would die hard here. What is the assurance that government 
will be fiscally responsible in this election season. Mm. And I also think that there should be more structural reforms to promote uh, productivity and enable competition in the economy. And I'm talking about measures to improve the business environment, right? Encourage investment, strengthen the labor market. This is not to say that we will not succeed in our efforts to restructure uh, our debt in the long term. I think we will. I like to remain hopeful that Ghana will eventually come out uh, strong again, knock on wood. I believe that uh, with commitment and uh, diligent implementation of sound policy reform, our nation will eventually recover. I don't expect the recovery to be quick, but I believe we can eventually get there and probably achieve our growth uh, projection of that 3.5% uh, forecasted by uh, Fitch Solutions and also end of year inflation target of 15% as forecasted. But it would take discipline and commitment. Well, I'm joining you in that hope, Dr. Dupe. Hopefully we see a Ghana that is better. Benjamin. Um, I will go into the Daily Graphic newspaper now, and uh, there's Graphic SIC Step Up Partnership. Odor Basin, Encroachment Hampers Detention Ponds uh, Project, that story on page 13. Then 50 years after establishment, the banner headline, NSS gets first policy, 50 years after establishment. It, it goes on and on. And then other stories I'll likely take sneak peeks at. Lagos marks 10th anniversary of Chibok kidnapping, the Chibok girls. Yeah. Then NDC demands probe into stolen biometric machines. Donald Trump's hush money, a story I followed. A criminal trial opens in New York. And our courts to cap or not to cap. Mm. Uh, that's a story there. It's, it's by Rodney uh, Nkrumah uh, Boating. I know his take on some of these matters, but it's still an interesting read. You could get to that on page 10. Uh, he cites how... Uh, when news emerged recently about eight lawyers and 12 judges shortlisted for the Court of Appeal, some predictable complaints came to the fore about the president packing uh, the courts. But honestly, I feel at some point we may, we may need to have some system capping, else, because without a ceiling, you can also have a president who will come and, you know, and things might be problematic, both mm -hmm. from the Court of Appeal, in fact, the higher courts, the high courts, the Court of Appeal, and uh, the Supreme Court. But let me start from the start. A 10-year national policy that sets out a broad framework for transforming the national service scheme has been launched. The policy framework shifts the focus of the scheme from just mainly mobilizing and deploying graduates into various sectors of the Ghanaian economy into a more holistic capacity building and empowerment sector. The policy document has become necessary because the NSS has operated for years without any formal policy guidelines. Therefore, the policy document represents a paradigm shift to ensure that service personnel are adequately prepared to transition to the world of work. President Ekufuado launched the policy known as the NSS Policy 2024 to 2034 in a cry yesterday with a call on all to embrace the changes and focus on the new face of the NSS. Um, the same NSS that uh, some have been given options about. You remember the vice president has mm. said that it could be optional, optional yeah. and, and all of that. I don't know how Dr. Dogbe will feel about that. Uh, being optional, as he was talking about. I think he made mention of yeah. something related mm. to that. Let me go to page 13, and then you come in, then I'll do some other uh, stories. So, Odor Basin, Encroachment Hampers Detention Ponds Project. Efforts to construct uh, detention ponds, a major intervention in a craft floods uh, control project upstream of the Odor Basin, are being hampered by the encroachment of suitable lands by some private individuals. A detention pond is a large depression in an urban landscape that is designed to manage stormwater runoff by storing it and releasing it gradually until it is completely drained. Although six sites were identified in wetlands and watersheds mostly located in areas such as Abokobi and Damfa in the Gan East Municipal Assembly in the Great Accra region, the government could not acquire those lands. The coordinator of the Great Accra Resilient and Integrated Development Project, that's the Garrett Project, Dr. Kwejo Ohene, um, Safo, who discloses the, the Daily Graphic, said this crucial ecological resource had been taken over by traditional authorities and private developers. Mm. You know, this whole bit about sometimes that's where it's a sticking point. Chieftaincy land, of course, per the law, we know the role they play, but sometimes it becomes problematic, whether it's Galamse you are talking of or some of these incidents. And here we are, uh, traditional authorities and private developers being pointed to. But if a craft floods, all of us will complain. Yep. Dr. Dogwe, quick thoughts on these? 
Ben, I missed this one about the encroachment affecting the pond uh, project, and I don't have uh, enough color into the story. However, I have come to realize that encroachment generally, generally has been an issue hampering development in Ghana in various areas. It can limit the availability of land, just as you read, or space for development projects such as this one, and it takes time to rehome or relocate the, the encroachers. Then also dealing with encroachment involves uh, legal and regulatory complexities, sometimes in Ghana, and the slow pace of addressing this, even in the law courts, it doesn't make the situation any much easier, right? Government agencies, ministries, and the contractor, all of them, they must follow that due process, you know, to address uh, this type of encroachments, which often involves lengthy legal procedures and negotiations before you even uh, eventually evict the encroachers to get the work done. And sometimes, too, the encroachment can disrupt existing infrastructure and services. When unauthorized structures or settlements are established in areas that are designated, for instance, for utilities, transportation, or even uh, public uh, facilities, for example, I think it can hinder the proper functioning and also uh, further hamper projects like this one. We have uh, uh, an environmental impact here as well. We have social impacts, economic implications, and also safety and risk concerns when it comes to dealing with such encroachments, as we often see in Ghana, and how it, that impacts development. However, I think that we should be hopeful, right? This can be cleared, uh, hopefully, pretty quickly uh, to pave the way for the work to be completed. All right, let's get into some... Were you going to say something? No, go ahead. All right. Um, so there's... Um, as for the NDC's demand uh, of a probe into stolen biometric machines, I think we're very... We're pretty familiar with that uh, story, and I've, I've heard Fifi Fiavi Kwete uh, expanding on that. I know as far as the EC is concerned, some people have been pointed to, uh, some interdictions or arrests have been made, we'll, we'll see. Now the question is, what information have they played with? Uh, what will be the consequences of that? Those they are questions. They say that there's no relevant at. information that could influence the election. So let's see how that, that, that all plays out. Yeah. Mm. Lagos marks 10th anniversary of Chibok kidnapping. Ten years have passed since that fateful night when darkness descended upon the Nigerian village of Chibok. On April 14, 2014, Islamic extremists stormed the government girls' secondary school in the Chibok community in Bono State and abducted nearly 300 girls as they prepared for science exams. On Sunday, campaigners and those affected by the event gathered in Lagos to mark the 10th anniversary of the kidnapping, calling for the nearly 100 girls still in captivity to be free. The Chibok kidnapping was the first major school abduction in the West African nation. Today, survivors like Grace Dauda and Rebecca Malum share their stories of resilience amidst the trauma. You know, a lot of these girls were unfortunately violated. Sometimes yeah. I find it hard to use the R word. They were violated, yep. some came back pregnant, others have been pregnant, had children, and all of that. These were children. They themselves were children. Um, and you know, that hasn't been the last. In fact, very recently there was another one, I think late last year or early this yeah. year. And it just, it's just cold comfort, and some have criticized the Nigerian authorities, government and government out for their handling of the issue, but it's... It's, it's a really depressing... I mean, 10 years on, are they dead? Are they alive? What is the state of mind? Hundreds of still dead? remain with. A and what's, of what's them. even the life of those who returned? You know, it's not enough to just say you're celebrating or you're marking 10 years of the return of, you know, you know yes, of these girls. There are still some more... Or what is the Nigerian government doing? You know, right. to ensure that they're still trying to pursue these terrorists and return these girls each life Right. It's important. So what are they doing? I was following the news yesterday you know, on BBC. Dr. Hmm. Dogby wants to say something. No, I was going to say I'm glad that these girls were rescued uh, and returned successfully. Most of them, there's still some that are still left there, right? Hmm. Uh, ben, you rightfully said they were abused in various ways. Ten years down the lane, what have we learned as a continent? And what measures have been put in place to prevent uh, such acts of terror? Uh, sadly committed against children. I think more has to be done because even recently, just as you mentioned, I think I had about 130 students kidnapped somewhere in Nigeria again. It's just saddening that we keep hearing about these terror groups always targeting 
innocent children in Nigeria. I don't know what effort or investment the government of Nigeria has been spending to try to fight this acts of terror and restore security to the people up north. But I think more work has to be done because evidently the, the terror has continued unabated. And if you lived in the area, that area of Nigeria as a parent, you are not 100% guaranteed mm -hmm. that your child will come back home when they go to school. And it's an unfortunate ordeal that anybody, you know, anybody, including the parents, whoever they have to deal with. I think that Nigerian government may be able to do more, right, to collaborate with stakeholders, including uh, regional organizations, local communities, and international partners to solve this problem once and for all. Right. Hopefully, they would invest more in training and also equipping yeah. of their security forces, you know, to effectively fight these terrorist groups and decimate them. They need to enhance intelligence gathering also, uh, you know, and share capabilities uh, to pick up the, the activities and movements of these terrorists uh, even before they are able to strike. Right. And I'll also call for a more regional co uh, cooperation because if we allow these terror cells to grow unchecked in one country, they could be empowered to expand their operations across mm -hmm. the sub -region. So it may need some mm -hmm. more cooperation through organizations uh, such as um, uh, African Union and ECOWAS. And I think that collaborative efforts such as uh, intelligence gatherings and also conducting uh, joint tactical military games and operations in those areas where the terrorists operate, that could actually help drive them away uh, from the region, hopefully. And I think we need to start looking at the root cause of such uh, terror acts in Nigeria and also right. in the sub-region. Is it socioeconomic, ideological, whatever uh, political factors, and address it right from the root? Uh, right before we go, I mean, I'm not going to read the story. I'm sure you're familiar with the death of two in the Temamanjia uh, area. Two people, uh, Joseph Ajay, Ajete, 22, and Christopher Amu, 38, among you know, a group of people on a street procession as part of this year's uh, Belejo Festival and uh, a misunderstanding between uh, the celebrants and some Navy personnel, two of them shot. I always say that, of course, per the law, even if someone slaps you, your reaction must be proportionate. To what the person did. You can't say someone slaps me and then you go for, um, what would you call it, a pneumatic drill and hits the person or a gun. It's, it's, so it must be, no one is saying that it is right what the, the people did, if the throwing of stones and the rest, but was the reaction what it ought to be. And how come in this country we are always saying we are firing uh, warning shots, but the warning shots end up, you know, killing people. You fire warning shots into the air, right? It's like the Ejra incident, if you remember. Warning shots, yet we saw someone on one knee aiming, aiming into the crowd. What was that? Was that a warning shot the person was trying? I don't know, but... Um, and the families are demanding justice. They say they want justice. Justice must be served. Those who fire the shots must be fished out and prosecuted. On both ends, those who are guilty or culpable, those who were throwing stones and agitating, and those who shot both parties ought to be. We can't continue like this because, you see, it's someone else today. It could be you tomorrow. <laughs> That's how life is. Anyway, those are my final thoughts. Uh, Dr. Dugbe, we have to go. Any final words in some 20, 30 seconds? And we have to go. I just want to say my thoughts and prayers uh, to the families of those two young uh, fellows that we, we lost, right? Uh, but to your point, justice should not be carried on the streets of Accra or Tema. Justice has to be done in the law court. So let's keep our fingers crossed that there will be proper investigation into this and uh, those who are at fault will be brought to book. Doc, thank you so much for your time uh, with us uh, this morning. We're grateful. We wish you the best of the day. Thank you for joining me, yes. sweetie. <laughs> Abochi. <laughs> Dr. You, Wisdom Dugbe, of course, is a financial analyst. Now, right before we go, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us to bring you this segment. They're offering prostate screening for free if you're a man. Fertility screening for free if you're a woman. Their branches here in Accra, uh, Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard, Kumasi, Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takra Dianaji State, Tema Community 22, Tichiman Hanswa, and Esia Manzama. You can reach them on 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. But up next, we serve you sports. Do stay.
morning, everyone. Welcome to AM Sports. With me, Muftar Nabila Abdullah. The Ghana Premier League match day 26 continued on Monday when Accra Lions came up against Viviani Gold Stars at the Accra Sports Stadium. It was Accra Lions who walked away with a 2 0 win. Awin is looking for options. Takes the ball in the box. Nobody to connect. It's cleared by. But some chain ball falls to or draw. He shoots. Keeper fails to deal with it. And Accra Lions have opened the scoring at the Accra Sports Stadium. It is the striker, Mohamed Yaya, who puts Accra Lions ahead. But the goalkeeper, Kusi, should be doing better with that delivery from Odro. He fumbled. He gets punished. Accra Lions wouldn't mind. It's 1 0. 18 minutes at the Accra Sports Stadium. Accra Lions won. The BNE goal stars nil. Odro took his time, he got the space, powerful drive, but the keeper should be doing better. He fumbles and the striker makes no mistake. Long drive, decides to grab it, it bounces off his chest. And Gold Stars will get us going for second half action. Asuma and Dankwa. Accra Lions have a big chance to make it 2-0. Here is Awuni, and Awuni has made it 2-0 for Accra Lions. It was always coming. The move was obvious. And Daniel Kwame Awuni makes it 2-0. Just two minutes after the break, Accra Lions have doubled their lead here at the Accra Sports Stadium. And they take the seat in that famous Mohamed Kudus celebration style. Awuni picked the spot, but that's a clever ball from Asuma to find Amponsa. And Amponsa's through ball, brilliant. Awuni took his time, first touch. He didn't need three touches. They are back to winning ways after losing to Hearts of Lions on match day 25. And Gold Stars have lost for the first time in six games. Full time. Goes from. Now let's hear from the coaches of both sides, starting with Ibrahim Tanko, who is excited with the victory his side got against Viviana Gold Stars, whilst his opponent, uh, Fimpon Manso, is unhappy with the performance of his boys. And uh, very good points for us, uh, looking at where we climbed at the table. I think the boys did very well. I mean, we create a lot of chances, and then winning 2-0 two, uh, two against BBN is a very good resource for us. You must be worried that you are creating and playing exciting football, but you are not clinical enough up front. Yes, I think uh, it's true, but I mean, we're scoring two goals against a, a tough uh, club like BBN is not an easy job. Yeah, definitely we are going to keep on working till we keep on scoring. Yeah. Although there are other teams who played throughout the week, but within one week we've traveled to Accra on two occasions and then played again on Wednesday and then to press with such uh, conditions, it was very difficult for us. If it were to be a team which doesn't do that, so you could see they were comfortable because they, 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 they can pass, they can build. So to prevent them, you needed to press them, to force them to kick long balls. And we were finding it difficult to do that because of our, our physical condition. So for me, that was the, the, main, the main reason that have affected us here. Kumasi Asante Kodoko is a club that is in trouble. Ten matches, eight defeats, one draw. And the fans of the club are unhappy with the current performance of the Porcupine Warriors. There's more in this report. The Porcupine Warriors suffered their set defeat in seven games as they lost 2 0 to Dreams FC on March Day 26 on Sunday at the Theatre of Dreams in Dewu. Kotoko, whose last positive result was a draw against Bechem United on March Day 24, were looking to get their first win since the 1st of March. However, the CAF Confederations Cup semi-finalist added more misery to Kotoko's problems. Sylvester Simba got things off for Dreams at the Theatre of Dreams, scoring after 25 minutes to put the still believe lads in the lead. John Enchi. You're Simba. Simba. 
Derek Atta Eje doubled the tally for Karim Zito's side after the break as they went on to claim all three points. Derek Atta Eje, John Enchi, lovely play from Enchi. Here is Atta Eje, chance for dreams. It is Atta Eje, Atta Eje shoots and Atta Eje scores. The defeat means Kotoko stay in the 11th position, just three points off the relegation zone and 16 points off the top sports in the league. For fans of the club, an urgent coaching shake-up is needed to turn things around. We need to sack the coach and find a new manager to turn things around. We also need to buy new players suitable for the club because Kotoko is not a club that should lose six games in seven. Since I was born, I have never seen this kind of performance from a Kotoko team. Otunfo needs to act and change the technical team. The coach is not helping the club. The club is killing us emotionally. We are tired and have left the team for them. This cannot be the state of Kumasi Asante Kotoko. But former player and current coach of Dreams FC, Karim Zito believes fans of the club must abandon their title hopes for the season and remain patient and supportive of the players and technical team. But all what I want to, to for them to understand, this is something called an, a change of event. You understand me? It's, it's about moment. The moment we are we, we are in now, they are having a bad day, bad bad. So all what I would like the supporters to do is they should they should not you know. The way they were, they were hooting and shouting at them brought in the psychological point of coaching that fear of failure can let you fail. So when you don't take time, this fear of failure will let the players fail injuries because they are afraid to come and then when there's a loss, what are they going to do? So I'm, 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 I would like to take this opportunity to plead to our supporters. Now we should forget about the league. We should try to end it. We should make peace with reality. The team is not in good shape. So the shouting and the hooting will not bring it back. But patience and focus can bring it back. So I'm pleading to them. Meanwhile, assistant coach David Okolo remains confident in the team's ability to turn things around for the Look at the Ghana Premier League table after March Day 26. Eight more matches to end the Ghana Premier League season for 2023-2024. Summer text this is at a summit. Wait. 49 points. Nation FC have got 44. Adriana Stars 42. Mediama 39. Accra Lions have also got 39. This is the second half of the table. Asante Kotoko have got 33 points. And Real Tamale United, Heart of Lions, and Carolina United. These are the teams rooted at the foot of the Premier League table. Ghana Athletics President Bar Fusilian has revealed that the country could be hosting the next edition of the African Senior Athletics Championship. According to him, Ghana will be to host the event that will be happening in 2026. I don't have enough way to describe the importance of these tracks for Ghana athletes and Ghana athletes. Um, it is one in its kind in Africa. It, only Botswana and Kenya has this. There's, even Morocco doesn't have this one. So that shows how important it is. My prayer is that we should be able to keep it for the foreseeable future. We should be able to keep it good in two, three years time that we can request to host African Championship. That is our next big thing that we want to do. We will request for African Championship in the next two, three years, and we will continue to do the Grand Prix that will start, will start next year. And we'll also request to have a high performance center with this facility. What we need is to get a coach, a resident coach, to come and stay in Ghana here. The facilities are good, the electronic equipment are good. What else do we need? Ghana Athletics President Barfusun is speaking there. Now let's talk about the Ghana Fastest Human. It is in its 11th edition. And uh, Secretary to the President, uh, Asante Pidia too, has said that in this year's event, they expect to be able to raise athletes that will be participating in the Olympic Games. We are looking forward to uh, more of them participating in the Paris uh, Games as well. And um, I know that the President is determined to do whatever he can, just as he has done for the Africa Games, to ensure that um, we are 
uh, we move several notches higher in at the Paris um, Games. The, the, the benefits are self-evident. I don't think um, anybody uh, can challenge that. But we need more people uh, to support uh, the program. And any time that um, I am privileged to have this sort of platform, I think it's very important that we make this appeal uh, to corporate Ghana to really, um, and, and philanthropists, to really support the program. It's, it's fantastic, and um, uh, to the extent that it also helps the young athletes get an education, you, you couldn't be better than that. There will be UEFA Champions League football, which will be happening tonight. Let's take a look at the fixtures as the quarterfinal of the competition enters is match day two. We we'll have Barcelona come up against PSG, Borussia Dortmund will play Atletico Madrid, Bayern Munich comes against Arsenal and Manchester City versus Real Madrid. And uh, Barcelona, they've got advantage, having won the first like 3 2 at the Pacta Princess, and Borussia Dortmund against uh, Atletico Madrid. Atletico Madrid have the advantage as they have a 2 1 advantage. Arsenal and Bayern Munich, that one is still locked at 2 2. Anybody's game and um, the game involving Manchester City and Real Madrid as well is also deadlocked. So what it means is that anyone still stands a chance of qualifying to the semi-final of the competition. On this note, this is our wrap-up AM Sports. I am Muftao Nabila Abdullah. We appreciate your time. Well, we get into that all-important conversation this morning, and it is a wet morning, it is a sad morning, as we discourse on this matter, involving the Tema Newtown uh, shooting incident, where um, two people lost their lives. Our brothers lost their lives, and uh, we continue with that discourse as far as the Ghanaian military is concerned and what the way forward is going to be. Joining us in the studio, for starters, we have... Oko Oninku Henry, he is youth spokesperson for the Tema Traditional Council. He is right here in the studio with us. We also have Janet Amu, sister of uh, the deceased, one of the deceased, Christopher Amu. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, sir. And um, it is only fitting as we start off the conversation to extend our condolences, sincere condolences on this, this loss I know when you set out marching through the streets of Tema for this festival, you, you, it never occurred to you that you would return with such a situation. Yeah, mm. Thank you. Um, but how best to start the conversation than from starting with what really happened from you two? So let's start with uh, you, Henry, in respect of what happened on the day. Walk us through what happened. So thank you very much. Um, once again, before I, I speak, let me say a very good morning to the Tema Traditional Council and also our condolences once again to the Buried families and Tema in general. Um, everything happened in my presence. I was part of the procession. The one thing is that when you come to Tema College, Tema College basically means that we are preparing ourselves for the annual Omawa Festival celebration thing. And one thing I want to put across I think when this very issue generated, so many people are saying so many things. Tema doesn't belong to anybody. Tema is this, Tema is that. We want to put it on records that those that kept saying that Nkrumah built Tema. Tema has been in existence before Nkrumah came to the scene in the year 1959. So fast forward, we've been celebrating Pelagio Festival for about 400 years now. And this very celebration, this very year celebration started from 5th April, 6th April, and then 7th April. We have done everything we have to do as far as the College of Festival is concerned. And we have some principal streets in Tema. Even if the Commander-in-Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces stays there, since it's actually a street that leads to our customary right, we, we, we use those places. And it's a typical street is that the frontage of the Eastern Naval Command where the incident happened. Mm. We have used this place. We have done, I mean, three colleges already. We do it, um, I mean, four times. We have done the Sakumo Poly, that is Friday, we have done Chadi Pili, that is Saturday. We have done um, Sakumo Pili on Sunday. 
And the climaxing of the whole thing has to do with what we were doing last Friday. And this very incident happened. Like I mentioned, I belong to one of the groups in Tema. Our name is Aiseke. We have another group that is also known as Jamaica. And then these two groups are more like rival groups because we come from different quarters as far as Tema is concerned. Tema is basically Awudu and Ashaman. Though we have seven quarters, but currently as I speak to you now, it has been divided into two. Awudu and Ashaman. So everything we do, whether football, whether Pelejo, the thing looks like rivalry, but then inwardly we know we are, we are one people. So these groups I'm talking about, because I belong to one of these groups, the end of Tema Pelejo, in fact, we didn't want anything to happen. And to be precise, in fact, let me just be real. This year's Pelejo has been one of the peaceful Pelejo we have ever witnessed. Because most of mm. the times, after the Pelejo festival, you have people coming in. My car has been broken. My mirror has been broken. And the traditional council sometimes bear the cost. But this year's Pelejo has been one of the most peaceful Pelejo we have ever witnessed until this very unfortunate incident happened on Friday. So we were approaching the military base. And then, I don't know, my group was actually leading. And we saw this Lily branded H200 Toyota Haze. In fact, when you get to their entrance, they have, I don't know how they call it, but then they have these bricks that they have arranged. Maybe something like a, a sun in a sack. They have arranged a sort of a, barricade. A, a, a sort of barricade. So we were coming from the top there. We realized that this car was actually coming and then he was just, just like, I don't know if it is speed race or the car was doing. So the youth, so the are, mass, you, are you suggesting the car was speeding? He was speeding. The that, car that was the naval was, officer. The naval officer. But, we didn't even know it was a Neval car. I saw Lily branded car. But we went closer to it. In fact, the car stopped instantly because the crowd actually stopped the car. And the guy started hitting the car because it was between life and death. So later on, I approached the car because I was their leader. And I realized that it's a military um, um, van. One person came out of the okay, car. Okay, so, so let's take the story slowly. In other words, you're saying that the hitting of the car only happened when the naval officers were speeding. We're speeding, exactly. So people were trying we to... We stopped them, exactly. Okay. So after we stopped them, we started hitting the car. And then I approached them and I realized that two military men came from the car. In fact, they had guns on them. So with the, with the gun alone scared my guys and everybody was trying to run somewhere because they felt because they have hit the car, I mean, the military people are going to arrest them. They left. And one guy also came back from came out from the car and was speaking fluent guy with me. I was like, he mentioned my name, future MP. Come on, no, we be a fee. So with future MP, look at what your people have done. So I was like, senior, the way you are speaking fluent guy means that you understand the culture as far as the collegial thing is concerned. Why should you allow the driver to be speeding in our midst this way? And then he replied me, it, it's already, um, I mean, we have already done that, but then uh, let's try with a means by which we can settle this. So the two of them that, El alighted early on have already entered the base because where the incident happened and that of the military base is just like two minutes drive. So they have entered the base with their guns. I was telling them that, in fact, my group has already been dispersed, but there's another group following, the rival group that I mentioned. So I will plead with them to drive their car back into the base. And later on, the driver called my attention to a windscreen that has been broken. So I told the driver, he's also in a military uniform. I said, is, is, is this the Lily branded The Lily branded vehicle. A windscreen had, had been the wind shattered. Has, has been broken. I mean, a portion of it. A portion of it. Yes. So I On account of what, what some of fire exactly. Okay. So I was like, don't worry. I am the spokesperson as far as the youth is concerned in Tema Traditional Council. The next morning being Saturday, I'll take you to the Traditional Council. We are going to fix this. We settled that. I think we took about three minutes. We settled this. They respected me and they moved the car back into the base because I wanted the other group to pass. So right after settling that, I went back to the rival group I, I, I was saying they were following us. And I told them that, my, my bosses, this is what has transpired between my team, Team Aiseke, mm -hmm. and that of the military. So as a matter of agency, I want us to leave the scene. So I was waiting for the last group, the last person on that lane to leave the scene. All I saw was about six military men with their guns coming out of the military base through their main entrance, and they started arresting, arresting anybody they, 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 they saw. They didn't just arrest them, but they were beating them. Some were having belts, others were using their guns. Just this morning, um, um, yesterday in the evening, one guy came to the traditional council with their jaws rolling because he was part of those that were beaten by the military. Which part of the gun were they using? They were, I, 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 I can't talk about it, the back of the gun. So the butt, yes. the butt of the gun. I witnessed everything. They were just beating them, six of them. So I approached this military man, I was like, seniors, 
I've already spoken with you. Yes, they have broken the screen, which I witnessed. But it was as a result of the overspeeding thing you were doing. I have decided with you, I have discussed with you that I'll go to the traditional council with you and you are going to fix this. The only thing I heard from one of the military men is that if you don't leave, let me go slap, slap you. This guy was in a mask. He if was you, in a mask. Yes. So you can't identify. I can't person. identify this person. So like, if you don't leave, let me go slap, slap you. So, you know, the flag we are holding is actually, the one with the flag is just like a contingent commander. Wherever he goes with the flag, we follow. So upon hearing that some people have been captured by the military, the flag automatically turned, the one with the flag turned with the mindset that we are coming to jubilate in the presence of the military base and they will release our guys. So just like, let me say, two minutes interval, there was, when you get to their entrance, there's this military guard who is playing a supervisory role, he's at the top. So I heard him loud and clear, be on alert and be on guard, which means that he was actually communicating that to those military men at the entrance. And quickly, I don't know if they felt we were actually coming to attack them. We weren't having anything like machetes. We weren't having anything like, like woods or something. And they started, in fact, what I saw, they were, were, they were firing into, into, into the air. Okay, so, so pause there for, for me a bit. You, know, you also know that this is a naval base. Exactly. It's a military installation. Exactly. Um, you don't enter a military installation under normal circumstances. Civilians, there are some places that are security zones. You don't enter like that. Right. And this was a mammoth crowd. Entering like that could also send a signal. You know that these are military officers. Technically, their training is also in a certain direction. Were you or your people, were you aware of this as you, as you went in there? Because though you may not have been holding no, we, anything, we didn't you enter still the end... So mm. there's no. a street? We, the street is actually a principal street we used. Yes. Right. Yeah, so we, and, and, and under no circumstance would even thought of entering the base, because definitely exactly. you can't enter a military base. In fact, you, 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 you end up being beaten. But had you gone past the road to the entrance point? I mean, their entrance is just by the roadside. And we have other people staying behind the military base. So it is just like a normal route we use. In fact, the, the, the principal street that leads to the only health facility we have in Tema, the Mahia Polyclinic, is within that street. So everybody uses that place. Mm. So we didn't go with the mindset of attacking the military. In fact, we don't have ammunition on us. But even when we were coming, they started firing indiscriminately, even in, in the air. So quickly, I had to find ways and means by which I can leave the scene. So when my guys also realized that they are firing, they also started, in fact, around that place, we have some gravels and stones around. And they also started throwing stones at the military. So hold for me again. You're saying that the military or the naval officers or whoever started firing first. Exactly. What was supposed to be, were warning supposed shots. to be warning shots. Exactly. And it was only when they had fired that you started throwing stones. Exactly. The stone throwing did not start first. Not at all. Mm. Not at all. But, but in throwing the stones, these are people firing bullets. Stones and bullets, you can't. So why were you throwing the stones? So the most serious route, that is when we also expected that even if anything of that sort has happened, I mean, the military, they've been taught conflict resolution and other things. You know how to control crowd. Not firing indiscriminately into the crowd. That has resulted in, in, in this um, casualties we are seeing. So I even went to the extent of using another alternating route through the Maya Polyclinic to go and calm my guys because at that very instant, I can't be in the middle because the military was here. My guys were also throwing stones. So upon reaching that um, other route I mentioned, the polyclinic route, that I realized that some people are being rushed in there, about three of them. Two of them got there and then the, 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 the lady we met was like, no, these people, their cases are very critical. They should be transported straight to the Temajana Hospital. Another two people had some gunshot wounds and they were being treated. Unfortunately, around 12 a.m., we had the incident that um, two of our, our, our guys have actually been killed. And the most unfortunate part is that one of the diseased persons, I shared water with him probably three minutes after the incident happened. So when I saw his picture, I was quite um, down a bit. So basically, this is what really, really transpired. So you did not see when the, any bullets may have caught some of these people, but all you saw was that two of these people, three of them were being rushed towards you, two in critical condition, as, as later was. Exactly. Confirmed. And the one thing is that the moment the firing started, every light within the entrance of that enclave was putting off. 
once, the once the shooting started. Once the shooting started, every light we did, even their buildings and everything within that stretch, they have a, um, a sick bay even within that very jurisdiction. Every light around that place went off. So uh, that is when I had to run for my life. Wait, uh, do you know whether it was a power outage? Because it we wasn't are, a power outage. Or do you feel, and I'm asking for your um, guesstimate here, that someone from there turned it off? Personally, I, I, I think they, they, they turned it off because that enclave, whilst I was using the polyclinic and th those, those places, I mean, there were lights all over. But the moment the shooting thing started, their lights and everything went off. So you can't even identify that they were shooting this way or that way. But whilst I was there, I saw the shooting in the air. Yeah. At least you saw that they were shooting exactly. into the air. Exactly. While somehow, I was there. somehow, exactly. some people. Um, uh, th thank you, Henry. Just, just hold for me. Let me also bring in our other guests online uh, yeah. right before we hear from Janet, uh, sister of the deceased. We also have joining the conversation Peter Lanchini Tobu. He's a member of uh, Interior Committee of Parliament. Uh, uh, Supo, if you are on, please. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll have him joining the conversation shortly. Also to join, Dr. Nanaya Wakwada, Executive Director, Bureau of Public Safety. And then uh, Dr. Ishmael Nidodu, uh, former UN official in the Sahel. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, you for having me. me. All right. Uh, just hold for me briefly. I'm going to hear from the sister uh, of one of the, the deceased as well. And then I'll come to you, gentlemen, with your craving your indulgence. Uh, Janet, so le let me hear from you. Were you part of the procession? No, please. You were not part yeah, of the procession? Yeah, so I actually don't live in Tema, but I was born and bred in Tema. Okay. So my parents are there, my siblings are also there. Now what happened is that, uh, my, according to my sister, they had a call late in the night, around 9.30 p.m., that um, already they've already heard that there are some shootings going on in the town. So people were running for their lives and all that. And they, they didn't even think that they, they, their relative was, was part of those who were injured or something like that. Mm. So now when they heard the call, it, because it was circulating on social media, all of a sudden people started seeing pictures. And then they saw my brother and mm. they called my sister that uh, they think what is happening, my brother was also affected. And so my sister called my mom. My mom is, is, is beyond 70, so you can imagine. And she had to join my sister, and uh, they rushed to the Tema General Hospital because I was told that at that point there were some papers, documents that were supposed to be done that they needed family members. Right. And so it was, it was even a friend of my sister who called her. So when they got there, they saw my brother um, lying down on um, the stretch, uh, lifeless. And, uh, that is at the hospital. At the hospital. Mm. And so they, they tried all they could. They, they saw that no, he was already gone. And uh, people had been there already to, to see to whatever needed to be done. So they went there and saw the body lying down there. But as to what exactly happened, they were not there. It was videos and other stuff that they saw online. Now, my sister took pictures of the body. Okay. And she took pictures of the gunshots right on the chest of my brother. On the chest? On the chest, yes. So he received the gunshot on his chest. And it was small, very, very small. At that moment that the incident happened, my, my brother actually works at the port. So he went to the work and on his way home, you know, this is something that we do almost every year. And so when he was on his way home, he noticed that, okay, today is the last day. Let me just join and then keep fit. So that was what he actually joined. He hadn't even gotten home yet. And then this happened to him. And how did it make you feel when you were told about this and eventually seeing your mother, your sister? I mean, what was the feeling like? It was terrible because my, my dad is also around 74, who is a stroke patient. And uh, this, my brother, is the one who takes care of him. You know how, at right. that stage, yeah. the diaper wearing and all those things. So my brother actually is the one who does this for the family. You understand? And so my, my mother couldn't take it. In fact, 
for those of us who were living out of Tema, they couldn't even tell us the news because they didn't know how we were going to, to take it until in the morning when, when calls started coming. Of course, it was online, so people started calling us and sending us messages, and then we had to rush to, to go and see my mom. Yeah. And your brother was 38? No, my brother is 40. 40. Yes. Okay, then there is some because the story the the daily is in the yeah. graphics it, says it's, it's normal, So he was yeah. actually 40. Yeah, I follow him directly, so I know his date of birth. Yeah, yeah. my brother is 40. He turned 40 in February. Mm. And as of now, of course, you say the gunshot wound right before I go to the other guests, but there's no autopsy report. Autopsy is, is going to be done today. Today? Yes, around 9, 9.30 a.m. To confirm. To confirm. What led but to the But per the pictures the that my sister took with her phone, it wasn't knife. I mean, because we saw in the news where the armed forces came up with their statements that mm. um, those who got injured were gunshots, but those who died were bullets, uh, were um, knife. Mm. I mean, it, it doesn't work like that. Is it because those people are alive and they can speak for themselves? So they can tell them that, okay, yours is gunshot, but those who are dead, they are gone, and so we can use something against them. No. My sister took pictures, and we have it. I have it on my phone. So this is the sad incident. I'll be going to my guest, but right before I do that, I just want to take a few seconds to read the statement from the Ghana Armed Forces. It is crucial so that we situate the conversation properly with our guests who are technical people, if we can have uh, that statement on the screen. But I have it here, and it's dated the 13th of April, 2024. It's titled, Attack on Naval Base Tema. And it says, and it's the wording I want us to pay attention to, especially for my guests. A vehicle belonging to the Eastern Naval Command of the Ghana Navy was attacked by a crowd partaking in an ongoing festival at Tema Newtown at about 7.53 p.m. on Friday, leading to the damage of the vehicle. Three of the naval personnel on board the vehicle also sustained, note, severe injuries and were sent to the Tema Naval Base Medical Center for treatment. In the course of the confrontation, three suspects were arrested by the Navy personnel. They were subsequently handed over to the Tema Newtown District Police for further investigations. A mob suspected to be part of the participants in the festivities, later attacked the Tema Naval Bas, uh, Base with stones and other implements with the aim of releasing their colleagues. At a stage, the security of the base was threatened, and in order to protect the sensitive installation in the base, warning shots were fired to repel the attack. It was later reported by the police that two civilians were brought to the Tema Central Hospital dead. The cause of death is yet to be ascertained. Again, on Saturday, 13th April 2024, the mob attacked the Tema Naval Base and the Naval Barracks at Tema Newtown, Beer Barracks, leading to the destruction of property. The Ghana Police Service, in collaboration with the Ghana Armed Forces, have commenced investigations into the incident. And it goes on and on. It is signed by E. Agri Kwashi, Brigadier General, Director General Public uh, Relations, and um, distributed. Let me come to my guests now, and I will start with... Um, Dr. Akwada, uh, on, on this matter, Executive Director, Bureau of Public Safety. Uh, how, how and, and this question goes to both of you gentlemen, what is your appreciation of what happened uh, from the narrative you have known and from what we've heard in the studio? W what is your understanding of what happened? Uh, very good morning to you and your viewers, and as well as to the panelists. Um, I think, in short, I would say that it's, it just shows or gives away um, an armed force or a branch of an armed force that lacks, you know, strategy. Um, that does not, it's not actually pursuing any strategic objective as far as uh, relations with the community is concerned. And uh, this is not peculiar to only the naval, um, you know, force but it's something that we have seen across the general armed forces, uh, which is not a good sign, especially for our development and for the advancement of our democracy. Moving forward, there is a need for us to take very pragmatic and 
um, um, bold steps to get our military, uh, if you like, the armed forces to pursue very strategic objectives that align with the promotion of uh, democratic tenets. Um, l l let me come to you, Dr. Dodu, then. For you, what story have you heard and what would be your key takeaways from this incident, the, the response from the Ghana Armed Forces, and what you've heard this morning in the studio? Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to um, say good morning to, to viewers. Um, also, uh, I would like to uh, share, share my, send my condolences to the two deceased uh, families. It's such a heartbreaking news. Um, you know, young people are there at the prime of their, their youth uh, who are truly uh, national assets uh, and then you just lose their, their life uh, tragically and in, in this is quite worrying. Uh, what, what I hear from, uh, from talking to different um, stakeholders and I've had some conversations with some, uh, some people in the, in the Navy and the military side, uh, I've spoken to some of the traditional authorities and some of the youth groups um, in fact, the, the, narr the narration that I just heard from the youth leader in the, in the Tema a traditional uh, council is actually consistent with what I, I, I gathered around. Um, and so I think that it, it really what happened was um, an issue of indiscipline um, uh, that you know, perhaps the military uh, gentlemen who were actually in the, in the vehicle uh, they don't exercise uh, because normally uh, when these uh, festivals are happening, um, the, it, this festival has been happening for, for many years and uh, the community, the Tema community and the, uh, the Neva base have actually been in existence for more than three decades. Yeah. Um, and, and so this festival uh, is something that is known and it's fact, normally it is framed within the ambit of uh, the community security and social cohesion. Uh, it is really nice. In, in, in the past, what we have seen in these festivals that even the naval base uh, command uh, really get involved and to provide the security, they work with the traditional authority to designate uh, the, the areas where they have to do the procession uh, and so on. And so having, hearing this uh, is, is very, very, very worrying. And in fact, as uh, my other guest said, we, we, are, we, are, we are witnessing uh, a breakdown of indiscipline in the, in the security sector and security forces, particularly the military, uh, in situations where there have been a confrontation between mob attack and uh, with mob attacks. And, and sometimes even the confrontation is, is simply something that they can dispel, uh, but then uh, you know, for lack of discipline or lack of tactics, uh, they they just they just get into this fray of punishing the citizens. Yeah. One thing that is very striking is why do you have a military covering his face? When have we seen a military personnel covering their their faces? Uh, we we believe that the military that we know normally have a certain decorum in terms of how they dress. Uh, I remember uh, one time I was walking the streets of Accra and I encountered some military who were actually dressed up with uh, with earrings and, uh, and and things like this. I mean, this is not the type of military. This is the type. This is not the type of military that we are used to, and it speaks to a larger issue of the profiling of our military in terms of how it is perceived, uh, not just within the regional perspective but internationally. Uh, it also speaks very well about uh, the, the, the type of military that we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the standards and decorum that is required for international best practices to the extent that this could be considered uh, uh, within uh, you know, the framework of international uh, uh, security uh, strategies for the, for, for the region. If you, for example, in UN uh, UN, uh, uh, for UN, you know, military personnel, for example, to be considered and things and, and so on. We have to be very, very careful. Um, we are talking about um, development. We are talking about uh, a situation between uh, social cohesion uh, within community that needs to be engendered and fostered by a military personnel 
military entity that has the presence in that particular community. Uh, so I, I, I see uh, this issue as uh, an issue of uh, lack of discipline. Uh, it, it's symptomatic of a weak, weak, a breakdown of social cohesion and community security in terms of how our our security entities within communities are, are working together. It also speaks to a certain level of uh, anger that is within within you um, of of the perception of of the of the of the naval base. Perhaps they they have been. Uh, you know things that are happening within the naval base, which the community themselves are not very happy about, and these have not been addressed. So, uh, you know, this whole issue, uh, you know, just 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 escalated. Uh, having said that, I am aware. That, uh, in fact, I was informed uh, that in authority that when they are at their naval base and they they are you know on guard, they normally have like bullets. I was wondering. Why uh, a live bullet would would be shot rather than a non-lethal weapon uh, used uh, for such a situation? But they, this is the standard practice that they normally have to shoot uh, live bullets, um, and and uh, it is the estimation of the of the guard that the the mob is attacking a military installation, uh, and if you are attacking a military installation, then they have the right to dispel you, and I think this is also. Uh, what would happen? Is that your reading of the matter? Right before I bring in uh, Superintendent Retired uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu, is that your reading of, of the issue that this was an attack? Because I've spoken to Henry in the studio, who speaks for the Tema Traditional Council, and he says there was no such thing. They were right at the, the entrance, the entry point. They had not got into, veered into the naval base, and in that this is the routes they use. So is it your understanding that there was some sort of attack? Because, and I ask that specifically because the statement from the Ghana Armed Forces says there was an attack, that some of their members were severely injured, and also that they got some of these people and subsequently handed them over, where the suggestion is that they were kept for a while, whether beatings happened or not, we, we cannot confirm, and then taken to, before they were taken, uh, to the police station. So I just want your take on that before I move on. Yeah, I, I'm just analyzing this from the circumspective evidence that uh, the, the, you know, the military uh, report have said that there was, they felt that there was an attack. Now we are hearing from the community that there was no attack. I think at the, at the point where the, the guards would have made their decision to shoot live bullets, they would have interpreted it as a threat. And I think that, for me, is is what 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 is concerning. Um, and I, I'll come to how this needs to be addressed because normally, uh, before you 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 get to the point where you start shooting like bullets and and so on, you have to do a very careful situational analysis. And one of okay. the, uh, right. in order so, to be so, very much aware. Mm, yeah. We'll get to the assessment. I don't want us to jump yes. the gun. We'll get okay. to the assessment of the situation. Uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu, thank you very much for joining the conversation, sir. Can you hear me? Hello, Hello Supo, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. It's, it's good to have you uh, join the conversation. You sit as a member of parliament, and for those who have discussed on this matter, we have um, the PRO for the Tema Traditional Council, the youth spokesperson. We have a sister of one of the deceased, but our other guests, uh, Dr. Akwada of the Bureau of Public Safety and Dr. Dodu, a former UN official, um, they have used words like there was no strategy to what the military did. That's Dr. Akwada. And for Dr. Dodu, there was a lack of discipline and maybe the assessment of the situation where they felt the naval base was under threat has to be looked at. From what you know, what will be your assessment of what happened? Thank you very much. Let me say good morning to our cherished viewers and listeners. What happened in Tema, Newtown, is an embarrassment to all of us as a nation. It's an embarrassment to the security sector of this country. Civil military relations, in other words, civil military cooperation is an old cause. That is taught every soldier. The relationship between the naval base and the people of Tama, Newtown, dates back to years. 
and this marriage has been so strong that they've lived together for years. What happened if I have the picture very clear? If the picture painted is that during the procession, which is a public event, it's a special event, covered by the Public Order Act, during the procession, the police were present to do what they know doing best, providing security for them to enjoy that right. If soldiers come to drive through the crowd, it is expected that there will be some level of scuffle. And if the police were available at the time, they would better advise soldiers not to do that. And if not, during the scuffle, the warning, alleged warning shot was, was, the alleged fire was done and two people lost their lives, I would say that is very unfortunate. The soldiers didn't use discretion. If that is not the case, and it is the case that during the scuffle, some young men were arrested and sent to the naval base. And the youth went to the naval base to force to rescue their brothers who were arrested. And the military said they had come to attack the base. If you attack a military base, you are looking for death and not peace. If it is that the youth actually attacked the military base, then we should be saying that they are lucky to have just two people killed. And it's unfortunate. But nobody in this country should attempt attacking a military base for any reason. If the civilian population is well educated enough about security matters, when a soldier arrests you and takes you to a military barracks, run to the police and go and report. The police are in charge of internal security. The soldiers have arrested my brother, they're taken to the naval base, and we don't know what is happening in there. Report to the police. The police will know how to handle it. But out of anger, if you attack a military base, you are calling for mayhem. In this country, all of us do know that soldiers do have their role protecting the sovereignty of the state. The police do have their role. So if what happened results in death, I am praying that there will be an independent body to go into this matter. Because the stories are not gelling. What the youth are saying is different. Gandango youth are saying something different. The military is saying something different. Somebody independent should stay in the middle and find out what actually happened. What triggered the shooting? And when you talk about the warning shot, a warning shot is not supposed to be fatal. Warning shots are not fatal in character. Warning shots are just the name that they are. It's to warn people not to advance again. But if you give a warning shot and it turns into a fatal shot, what it means is that according to your own training, you have to answer these four questions. Was the force that you used in using lethal force proportional to the resistance? Are you covered by any law who have shot at the time? If you are put before a judicial body, can you account for your actions and be happy? And the last thing, at the time that you are pressing the trigger, was it really necessary? If that was necessary, you should be bold to do it. And I've said this over and over. If you are in uniform and you have a gun, the gun is your friend. It's supposed to protect life and property, including your own life. If there is justification for you to use that gun, please use it confidently and speak about it confidently and let the world know I was right in using the gun. Let's not try to blue veil, let's not try to color anything when a soldier or a police officer shoots. Because the moment you shoot, you'll be held to account for it. And when you shoot with confidence because you are covered by law, say so. If you are wrong, just admit that, yes, this one, we are wrong. But you know what? We need an independent body to go into the matter so that at least the souls of these two young men can rest in peace. And if the military will have to do something about their men, we we'll open up and let them do something about their men. Because military barracks used to be very far away from town. Today we are living together. The military itself is changing. The society rules and regulations are changing. And as they change, we have to understand that the national security blueprint puts it very clearly. Youth unemployment is the greatest security threat to this country. So anytime you see young people gathered and they are in stand, it doesn't matter which uniform you are wearing. You should apply your safe brain, not the British force. Crushing them is never an answer in any situation in a democracy like ours. Could the situation have been handled better? And I come from this angle. You've already taken the wind out of my sail by talking about a proportional response, which I have spoken of. Uh, some say that, you know, our police force or our police service used to be a police force. That tag was changed and things gradually are simmering down. But 
with the rest of them, the armed forces, the military, the Navy and the Red, they still retain that force tag in there. And some say it gives them some idea of wanting to use a show of force. Of course, if you look at what the police has to do vis-a-vis -vis what the military does, there are differences. But is that orientation in itself a problem? And I don't see how, by the way. If you fire warning shots, they go into the air. The PRO, the, the youth spokesperson says he saw some of those. How that ends up hitting someone purportedly in the chest, I do not know, as Janet here uh, uh, suggests. W what is your reading of that? Thank you very much. Until we have access to the autopsy report, you wouldn't be able to say for a fact that a bullet hit somebody's chest. Mm. The autopsy report will give us clarity. That's why I'm calling for detailed investigation. The autopsy report will give us clarity the cause of death of the two young people. If they died out of bullet wounds, then we ask, how were they shot? Were they shot from behind or were they shot from the front? And the position of a warning shot is always 90 degrees with your muzzle pointing upward. If you have to do that. So I am saying that if you have to shoot, shoot with confidence. If it's a warning shot, do it right. Warning shots do not kill. Warning shots are not fatal. If it's expected to be fatal, do it and know that you are covered by law. And it is the last resort. Using the weapon is the last resort with all the graduated force that you have access to. Every step that you take, the weapon is the last resort. And the moment you grab your weapon and you want to press the trigger, all the questions that are in your brain are answered. This force I am applying is proportional to the resistance. My life is even at, at risk. My life is at risk, and if I don't use this weapon, I may even die. And you don't carry a weapon and stand and somebody else will shoot you and kill you. No. Probably the mob was rowdy or the youth were rowdy, and probably they were destroying property and even harming and killing people. When you use a weapon, you use it and you are justified. Whatever it is, at any point you are using the weapon, be confident in yourself that, look, I am using it, or I am going to be held accountable, and I will confidently say it because I am covered by law. If you are a soldier or a police and you shoot, and you want to be covered, you don't, you don't want to come out clean. It means that you knew you were wrong. If you are not wrong and you are covered by law, why are you carrying the gun? How many Ghanaians are carrying those guns? You are given the gun because you have the right to hold that gun. And there are rules and regulations governing the use of the gun. So when you are covered by rules and regulations and you are supposed to use the gun, use it with confidence. Don't be afraid. If you are afraid, it means that you are wrong. And if you are wrong, just come clear and say, this one, we got it wrong. It's simple. Um, just my final question to you on this, on this particular batch. I will definitely come to you. But uh, per the law, you know, usually we'll talk about the reasonable man in, in, in a certain action. What would the reasonable man do? Think, right? Yeah. Uh, the crowd was processing, and this is not the first time. In fact, per the uh, youth spokesperson, this is the third one, the Quilejo, that they are having within, you know, a space of, of time. And they do that. It's been going on. Once the naval officers were driving through or the military officers were driving through at some speed and it's a crowd what would the expectations have been in terms of a reaction and and the the other bit now if the naval base was indeed attacked as per the statement of the ghana armed forces would it justify the use of brute force which has now led to these two deaths uh, two quick questions and then i'll go to the other guests and then come into the studio as well Thank you very much. If the military installation was attacked by the youth, the military are trained to defend that property with all the zeal in them. Attacking the military property is not just the attack of the military property, it's attacking the gun armed forces. And if civilians begin to attack the armed forces, the army is trained to deal with combatants. They are not trained to deal with civilians. But if civilians are changing their color to the point that they can go and attack a military installation, you are calling for mayhem, and if, they will not pay you. Just clarify, that, that, even, that, if, even if these purported uh, combatants, because they are civilians, they don't have arms. All they have are maybe, the worst case scenario, they have stones. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to that before you proceed. Yes. I am saying that whether you, are, you don't have anything in your hand, you are armless, you are looking harmless, whatever it is, the psychology behind you attacking a military facility should never be part of our culture. Let's move away from that. Mm. Because our military has a very high international reputation. And sometimes 
when we push them to the point that, excuse me, they misconduct themselves, it gives the country a very negative image. When we talk about military brutality, let's also talk about civilian responsibility. Both of us, both of us must create the armed forces that we want. If the military is wrong, let's tell them that this is wrong. If you have an irresponsible group of people, let's also tell them this your behavior is also wrong. Because two wrongs do not make a right. And that is why the police stays in the middle. I am saying that if you have a problem with the military and you are brutalized, don't go to them, go to the police and go and report. The police are demanded to investigate everybody, including the soldiers. And this we must know as a people. So what is happening? This festival that has come, please, it is not going to be the last one. It's been happening. The police were there. Let me give you a very short example. I have participated in a festival procession like that. A young man took away my beret. I was wearing the beret. He took it away from me. But we didn't go chasing and slapping people. All we did was to get their ring leaders, and they finally got my beret back. And we still had a smile in our faces, because that is policing. In that mood, where the youth are charged, it's a festival. It has a culture. You have to understand them. They are not there to harm anybody. But, you know, when there are disagreements and you don't understand the culture of the procession, you can actually create mess and it will turn violent. What happened should be investigated, what happened should be kept, and we should ensure that it, doesn't have, it, it never happens again in our history. It is embarrassing to all of us as a people. Yes, but on the point of the reasonable man and, I mean, speeding through the crowd, I, I pose that question yes, first. I, I, once, I, once you're going at no. a certain speed through a crowd like that, what would you expect? It is recklessness for you to see a procession and drive through it, irrespective of which uniform you are wearing. Surprisingly for me, the police were there. And if they had consulted, if the military had consulted the police, can we go through this crowd? The police would have allowed them to stay away from the crowd just for a few minutes, and they would still clear the way for them to pass. It is not right to be aggressive driving through the crowd. You are, in fact, you are becoming provocative. And when you become provocative, it just show power. And when you do show power, in the midst of what we also have group think, because the whole crowd is there like a group. When you have a group thing and they can also react, it can only end up with violence. The best thing we can do as a country as we speak is to ensure that anything of this nature, we should be talking about de-escalation. We should not create a situation that can escalate tensions and escalate violence because people are frustrated. The young people in this country are very frustrated and we need to handle them with care. Well, thank you, uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu. Just hold, hold for me. The studio, just to clarify a number of matters. So, in this instance, I, some of the youth, they were taken to the naval, naval base right, right and kept, kept there for a while before they were taken because the statement says, subsequently, it doesn't mention they were taken to the naval base, but it says that subsequently, which suggests that something may have happened, and then they were taken to the police. Who, how many people were taken into the naval base, if any, and what happened to them? I think in my presence, I saw six people because the, the military men that came out, there were actually six people, and everybody, I mean, grabbed somebody. So in my presence, I saw about six people that have been um, arrested. And like so I said, about six officers grabbing six, six people, people and taking them exactly. into the base. And in fact, no, clarify, into, into the, base. the base. Into the base. So even at the entrance of the base, you could hear them shouting, screaming, hey, you are, hey, you are. So I, I, I felt uncomfortable because. In other words, they are beating us, they are exactly. killing us. They are killing us. So I approached one military person, I was like, Master, if you don't leave me, I will slap, slap you. So that is when I had to step back. So they were beating them. Just yesterday, one guy came, one of the victims, and then the jaw is swollen. He had bandage all over. The traditional council had to give him money, and I had to escort him to, 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 to the general hospital. So, I mean, they were just beating us anyhow. And like the um, security experts mentioned, we live with them. In fact, they are friends in the community. Yeah, Personally, I have two tenants who are military personnel in my, my own apartment. So we, in fact, we live with them. We drink with them. We do everything with them in the community. And one, one beautiful part is that the police were all over. You see them driving, but then the police will stop. Even when they have their sirens on, they will stop. They will stop, will pass, and they will continue. So we were living with them. And let me commend the district commander of the Ghana Police Service, Tema Mahia, to be precise, Mr. Eke and his men. They were, they, were, they were so lively on the ground. They, they have been with us. And it, it was beautiful. Like I mentioned, this is not the first time we are, we are celebrating the Collegial Festival. And this very incident will never stop us 
from celebrating our annual quality festival. And hopefully this will not lead to any frosty relations between you and not, the not military. Not, you know, we know the military the plays a very pivotal role as far as security in Ghana and everywhere is concerned. Now, when you come to Tema, we are giving them a vast land because we know what they are doing for, for the nation. They are built crew barracks. I don't know if you've been there. Look at, I mean, the portion of land that the traditional council willingly gave it out. So we don't have any frictions with them. Like I mentioned, I have two tenants who are military personnel. We have indigenous who are also in the service. So we prioritize the kind of work they do. But for you to underrate our, our, our celebrations. And one unfortunate thing is that I know some of them are bearing gun names. Others have Akan names. And they go back to their communities. They celebrate their festival. So what we are saying is that they should never underrate our festival. They should never intimidate us as far as our festivals are concerned because we preserved those lands before they have gotten whatever they have now. And I hope as you are saying it as spokesperson for the youth, it, it has simmered down that the youth also understand it as you understand it so that there will not be any further you know, escalation of, of this. Exactly. You, are, you are doing that, right? Yes, we have had several meetings with them. Just even this morning, around 9 a.m., we are meeting them again at the tra Tema Traditional Council because some of them will review that. Yes, we leave them in the community. We would also try to do whatever I want to do with them. But personally, we have had... So some, of, some meetings. of them are thinking of reprisals. That is exactly what somebody had. So we, we have called them, we have met them several, and those of us that we are youth, that we are opinion leaders within the community, both from the political um, um, divide, we are meeting them. Let me commend the Member of Parliament for Tema East Constituency, Honorable Isaac Ashao Damten, the Mayor of Tema, Honorable Yuani Amashite, the Regional Minister Designate, Honorable Daneni Kwateta Teglova. They have all put in aside their political affiliations. They have come together and we are solving this very issue. And one beautiful thing is that both of them took part in the Collegial Festival. So they know what we do as far as the Collegial Festival is concerned. Janet, and, and I know it is tough talking about this, but the truth must be spoken so that we all get to know what really happened. Yeah. You've already mentioned to me that the autopsy will take place today. Today, yeah. At 9.30 a.m. Yeah, 9.30 a.m. Um, do you have family members who will be there yes. to observe? Yes, to get yes, yes. So family members are there and they are going to observe. But I mean, we live in Ghana and now you can't even trust. There are trust issues. Uh, we are there just are trust hoping, issues? yeah, there are trust issues. I mean, there are trust issues. Mm. So we're just praying that um, nobody will alter anything. It will be just as it is, and then we'll go in there and then do it, and the, the truth will come on. But I, I, like I told you earlier, my sister took pictures, and it's just a small hole on the chest. Mm. Where, and my where brother, you I know, think, yeah, where that you is what, yes, yeah. that something could have penetrated. Something could have penetrated, Because yeah. then we have to leave the experts to, uh, to come through yeah, with whatever yeah, ballistic yeah. But, report. But like, like I'm, I'm telling you, we, we, we still uh, want the truth to come out. Nobody should cover up for anybody because a life has been lost. Why do you think there could be a cover-up? Why, why would that be something that would easily spring to your mind? Yeah, because um, even when the autopsy hadn't been done, I already saw in, 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 on social media the armed forces already saying that it wasn't gunshot when it has not even been done. Right. So once you even do that ahead of the autopsy, it means that you are already defending your people. People were on duty that day, and they need to stand up for whatever they did. They need to come out, and then they need to accept, take responsibility of their mistake. But if you come out even before the autopsy saying that those who got injured were gunshot, but those who died were out of a knife stabbing and all that, it means that already you are defending your people. And that is where we are thinking that something could go wrong. Mm. 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 So which family members are going to be there today? Just to clarify. Yeah, my sister is going to be there and then my cousins are also going to your be there. Your cousins are going to yeah. be there. Of course, your mom is already, you said 70. Yeah. This run around is not, is not the she best option be, for yeah. her. And your father, whom you say has suffered a stroke and this 40 year old, your brother, he does was taking care of him. My, my, my does dad. he know what is happening? He, he knows because people keep coming to the house. We have the minister coming around, we have the mayor coming around, we have people. And then my brother, some way, somehow, everybody knows very him popular. in the town. Very, yeah, he's very, very popular. popular, yes. And so people are coming around and where he works and, and all that. He was also born and bred in the town.
So you can imagine, my, we can't hide it from him. Ha has that affected him? Very, very much, yeah. Let, let me also get back to uh, our guests as we wind down on this uh, end of the conversation. I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Dodu. Having listened to all the ends, uh, the loose ends, the autopsy today at 9.30, uh, what the military has said, what the family and the youth group have, have said, what Peter Lanshini Tobu, who has been in, in the service, the police service, has said, what would be your reflections on what the way forward should be. I think you are the one who made mention of an, um, uh, a group to conduct this investigation that is not aligned. But what would your expectations be moving forward on that point? Right. Uh, thank you very much. I would I'd like to underscore again that uh, this is a very sad situation and listening to the sister of the deceased and talking about the, the impact of this sudden and tragic death on the family, especially the, the, the father and the mother and, the, you know, and even the community is quite um, disheartening. And I will express my condolences again. I think what is important to do is to uh, do a couple of things. Uh, the military is beginning to lose um, its, its uh, reputation. So they may, they may have to do some reputational damage. Um, listening to the issues that um, have been raised by the families and by uh, the, the member of the interior committee who was actually uh, on the service, uh, really tells, gives, gives the, uh, the impression that uh, the military, uh, perhaps in their statement, they are not being very uh, truthful in, in what had come out. So then if that is the impression that is being left in the minds of, of the citizens, uh, it's a very, very uh, uh, damaging reputa uh, reputationally for, for the military. So they need to really deal with that. The second, the military needs to make sure that there's a real accountability. Uh, those who were involved in, in this incident, those who started it, the one who was driving through the, the, the procession, um, and then the, the, those who actually shot the, the guns and uh, what, what went into their uh, you know, judgment in terms of why they have to use little weapons. Uh, and did they actually shot a gun, uh, you know, it was a warning shot, or they were aiming at individuals to kill them. Um, all these things need to be addressed. The second aspect is also the issue around discipline. Uh, we have seen time and time again that these issues is, is happening, to, uh, you know, too often. And it's, it's even to the extent that it's becoming an existential, existential threat um, uh, to, to the peace and security of our country. Where citizens don't feel safe, where citizens feel that um, if they are, you know, uh, somebody who is in the security sector actually um, unjustly kill them or, or do something to them, they don't even have uh, justice. It is a, it's a very bad situation because he really reflects on the overall rule of law uh, of the nation. And that leads into, uh, you know, some, you know, issues around social cohesion. Uh, with with modernization of everything and there's an urbanization happening in the capital, you are likely to have military installations spreading in, into communities where they, they were not uh, before. And so there must be a way for the security sector to be able to, to manage their social, uh, social cohesion issues with the communities. And I think something like this uh, should be an opportunity for the military to really sit down with the traditional authorities and, and, and really try to address the issues very well and come out with a set of standards or decorum of how they would, they would be able to work together and live together uh, with the people. Uh, the final thing I wanted to say is we are, we are going into elections. Now, when citizens begin to have this perception of the, the highest form of security apparatus, which is the armed forces, to the extent that they cannot trust it. Uh, and then we do have issues around our policing and their capacity and how citizens don't feel much more trusting of the police compared to the, to the military. Uh, and you are having that at the highest level of trusting the security apparatus is being, uh, the confidence being, being destroyed. Then 
citizens will be very, very worried in, in, in the wake of elections because they will be thinking, what if, what if? And that's very, very dangerous uh, for our democracy. So it is very, very important that we take really lessons from this issue and the military reassure uh, the, the nation that they are bringing, you know, they, they, they are making sure that people are going to be held accountable. And they are holding themselves to the highest standards that we know of them. Uh, we, as a final, but my last point is this, I also have a feeling that there are miscreants who are emerging in the security sector that we need to deal with. I don't know how these days recruitment is, is happening, but there seem to be a, a certain level of politicization of the, of the security sector. Now, to the extent that uh, you know, political parties see it as an avenue for creating jobs for some of their boys. And so you have individuals who go into these, whether in the military, the Navy or the immigration or whatever, who, who don't feel that because of the way they were recruited, uh, they, are, they have to you know, subject themselves to the tenets, the decorum and the standards of the, of, the, of, the, of the choice of the sector they've been put to. So in other words, they have people in high places, so they don't even respect command. Now, uh, these things is what brings, out, brings about some of these issues where uh, a military, I can't even imagine a military person uh, of the of the standard that we have, we have we we hold them to drive through a <laughs> procession such as that. What were you thinking? I mean, as a disciplined armed force personnel, you would never even think about that. So if they will have that confidence to be, be misbehaving in this way, I think that the issue of the recruitment and how they feel uh, untouchable within the command is something that, that is coming out and it's coming as a result of the right. heavy politicization of, um, of that security sector. And that's right. very, very worrying and concerning to the nation. Thank you so much, Dr. Dodu. Uh, for you, Dr. Akwada, before I take uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu and then we wrap in the studio. Dr. Akwada. Well, thank you. Um, I think I would like to uh, look at three things. One, um, <clears throat> Dr. Dodu mentioned um, Somewhere along the line, he mentioned something that was symptomatic of a breakdown of discipline. Um, one, we need to look at the leadership, both at the political level and at the institutional level. The kind of breakdown we are seeing in the last couple of years in discipline and the lack of professionalism, which is a... Hello, Dr. Akwada. Dr. Akwada, can you hear me? Okay. It appears we've lost uh, Dr. Akwada. If we're able to get him back uh, shortly. Uh, we'll... the, which is, yeah, which is, hello, am I, I'm back? You're back. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, which is out there is largely due to weak political and institutional leadership. We need to get leadership to be tactical in their approach and to be very deliberate with the armed forces. If we don't and we, we you know, uh, dilly-dally with it, we'll be witnessing more of such. Number two, our armed forces must pursue strategic objectives, objectives of, um, you know, cultural understanding wherever we find ourselves. We need to pursue aspects of security cooperation with the citizenry and we also need to continually have community engagement. If these things were there and we're pursuing them strategically. All right, uh, Dr. Akwada, I, I think the connection is not uh, very helpful on this matter, but uh, uh, Peter Tobu, your, your final comments on this matter. We're going to have another conversation with you, but on this matter, what would be your concluding comments, please? Thank you very much. Let me convey my heartfelt condolences to the Brit family and also to congratulate the youth of Tema Newtown. Uh, the poster of the youth from yesterday up to this morning is quite encouraging, and I will encourage them to continue to hold it because the relationship between 
the people of Tema and the, naval, and the naval base. In other words, the relation between the people of Tema and the Ghana armed forces can never go frosty for more than 24 hours. Whatever happened, we are going to investigate it, and the truth will come out. And they should, they should remain calm. Because these are things, it, it's just like a family. Husband and wife, once in a while, something will happen. And this is the first time that it has happened. So let's not heighten it too much. One thing that excites me most is the fact that uh, Lieutenant General Thomas Opon Prepra is the chief of defense staff. He's an armor man. And this is the first challenge that I'm throwing to him. He should activate civil military cooperation to the highest level. Because the military is changing and they're living with amongst us. It's not like those days that the military barracks is very far away from town. Lieutenant General Thomas Opon Prepra, I encourage you, let this be a trigger that will activate your sense of commitment to ensure that the relationship between the Ghana armed forces and the civilian population is, is, is better. Um, Dr. Dodu made a point of the emergence of miscrimes in our security services. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a key point. It's, it's, it's relevant. And we should be very careful not to politicize, political, politicize recruitment. I have made a point this morning about the Honorable Minister for Interior making a public statement that he has told the IGP that they were coming out with a supplementary special recommendation list for the police college, where officers are trained to become senior police officers. And I said that is a no-no for a politician who is responsible for policy, attempting to go into operation and administration. That is absolutely wrong. And that is the point that Dr. Godu made. I think let's, 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 let's look at it critically. But um, this is a matter that has come. We all have to investigate the matter. And let's clearly ensure that we nip it in the back. It should never, ever happen, because it can give the country a huge debt. All right. Peter, just, just hold for me uh, just a minute, and then we're gone. Just to conclude with you, briefly, in about 30 seconds each. Janet, Janet okay, so, what's your concluding? I mean, I, um, what I want to say is that once we come to the end of this matter, uh, we want justice. Uh, my brother has left five kids behind and a wife. Uh, you know this day and age, even taking care of your own kids, how it is. And so um, once this matter is settled, we want the... Um, the authorities to take a look at that again for the family. Yeah. All right. uh, for you, Henry. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I will still um, seek for justice for these people because if things like this keeps happening, I mean, at last August, we were actually celebrating Homo War Festival. We had similar incidents right. from the Ghana Port and Abbas authorities. Up to now, the, there hasn't been any official report that shows that we were at fault or even the security agency was at fault. But one thing we want the security agencies to know is that they are there to protect us. We have given them everything they want, lands and accommodation and everything. They should make sure they prioritize whatever we do. Now, to end my submission, I once again want to say that the other family, in fact, we lost two people. The other person is also a very young man. And um, it, it, the whole thing shouldn't look as if we are only talking about my, my friend, Ajay. Yes. There's both. also Joseph Ajay. Yes, exactly. Right. We, are, we, are, we are speaking for both and we are seeking for justice for those two people. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Henry, uh, Oko Oninko Henry is youth spokesperson for the Tema Traditional Council. We also had the sister of one of the deceased, 40-year-old uh, Christopher Amu, that is Janet Amu. And then uh, we had Dr. Naya Akwada, Executive Director, Bureau of Public Safety. Dr. Ishmael Nindo, the former UN official in the Sahel. And uh, one who is staying with us, Superintendent Retired Peter Lanchini Tobu. He will stay with us. We'll be right back after a brief break to take a look at the CID boss issue and the court ordering uh, that arrest. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The court's decision came in response to an application filed by Sherwood Global Outreach an entity that seeking an order for the respondent to release a vehicle they had impounded with registration number GN2925-20 to the applicant. Despite the court's orders, the respondent repeatedly failed to appear before the court, leading to the issuance of the bench warrant. During proceedings on Monday, the lawyer for the applicant, Abraham Arthur, moved an application for the committal of the CID boss and the DG of the Legal and Prosecution Unit for Contempt. The court found that the respondent had blatantly refused to honor its directives, prompting the issuance of the arrest warrant. 
the court had specifically ordered the IGP to order the Director General of the Criminal Investigation Department of the Ghana Police Service, as well as the Director of the Legal and Prosecution of the Ghana Police Service, to appear before the court on Monday morning. And while the orders had been carried out, the two respondents were not in court. According to the court, there was evidence on record to show that the court orders had been carried out and that there was affidavit of service indicating that the order of the court to serve on the IGP had been carried out. Again, the previous order was served on the IGP on March 26th. The presiding judge says the court has extended enough courtesy to these public officers and due to the fact that there is nobody above the law, he issued a bench warrant for the arrest of the respondents. Reporting from the court complex, my name is Richard Kujenya for Joy News. So that is the story, which is why that high court has called for the arrest of these two, the Director General of the CID of the Ghana Police Service and the Director General of legal, the Legal Prosecution Unit of the Ghana uh, Police Service as well. We still have Peter Lanshini Tobu, uh, Superintendent Retired, joining the conversation. Welcome back, Supo. Thank you very much, What is your initial reaction to this development? And now the court saying that they had been invited to appear before court a number, on a number of occasions, and they had blatantly refused. For which reason uh, they are being cited for contempt? Your reaction? Thank you very much. Um, this is just to show that the rule of law is something that all of us should push for it to work. No single individual in this country is above the law. The Inspector General of Police, who happened to be the Chief Executive of the Ghana Police Service, a unitary command. The police service is a unit of command. So mm -hmm. if you invite the Ghana, if you invite the Inspector General of Police on matter of you know, on the matter of criminal investigation, he would direct the Director General of CID to respond. And that is exactly what the IGP did. What I've been told, I've tried to do some cross check. What I've been told is that when the the, the, the contempt application was filed, the Director General of CID was not served and the Director of Legal for the CID was not also served. And they were surprised, hearing it in the news, that the court had issued, issued a bench warrant. Simply put, even if you are a normal citizen, an ordinary citizen of this country, and a bench warrant is issued against you, and you hear it even on air, as a responsible citizen, what, citizen, what I expect of you is that within 24 hours, you put yourself before the court without any police officer coming to look for you. But here's the case. The order has been given that the Director General CID and the Director Legal for CID should be arrested. I expect them that within 24 hours, nobody is going to arrest them. They should voluntarily, as responsible police officers, walk to the court, present themselves before the court, and let the court appreciate that we didn't get, the, we didn't get any notice of the application for contempt, even though we have been here. But whatever it is that you fail to appear before the court on two or three occasions as as, 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 as stated by the judge, you go in there and try to explain yourself. And whatever it is, there will be a position by the judge. But I expect the Director General of CID and the Director Legal of the CID to appear before the court as soon as nobody should go looking for them. But this, this uh, positioning or this, this attitude where sometimes people are meant to appear before the courts, they are summoned and they refuse to appear, some of them... We've had ministers do that, you know, on a number of occasions and all of that. What signal does that send? Because in this instance, it, they've also been told that there have been attempts to retrieve that vehicle owned by Sureword uh, Global Outreach to no avail. The truth is that we have three arms of government. The police belong to the executive arm of government. And the government chief legal officer, the attorney general, will definitely always be giving them guidance. Mm. The judiciary is another arm of government, in another organ of state. And this checks and balances is enough to ensure that our democracy makes progress. So if you are invited to appear before a court of competent jurisdiction, in either respect of who you are, as a member of the executive, you are supposed to appear. If you don't appear, the judge is going to do what the law says he should do. And that is exactly what the judge has done. And I'm expecting the police the Director General of the Criminal Investigations Department and the Director of the Legal Division of the CID to immediately, as a matter of agency, 
respecting the Inspector General of Police that he has directed you to comply with what the court has directed. You appear before the court immediately and let the court know that you are not unprofessional police officers and that you respect the rule of law and that as law enforcement officers, you, are, you should be the first person to respect the law because it is an indictment on the, on the whole institution, the Ghana Police Service. And it's an indictment on the person who appointed you as Director General CID that you don't respect the law. I don't want to believe they will do that. And I'm quite sure that they will be before the court as soon as possible. Let, let me also bring in, uh, just hold for me, Super. Let me bring in Kweku Pinto, uh, who is also a lawyer, a practitioner of the law. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pinto, for joining the conversation, sir. Thank you. Uh, what is your initial reaction to this? I mean, it's not every day that you hear that the Director General of the CID or the di Director General of, uh, you know, uh, criminal you know, prosecution, the legal prosecution unit of the Ghana Police Service is actually being called for by the High Court in terms of an arrest for contempt of court. Uh, what is your initial understanding of what has happened? Um, I think it's in order. And I will say that because um, every, every disrespect that is shown to a court of law can invite the sanctions which includes an order for the person to appear before the court. I mean, and my understanding of what's going on is that the affected people, let me call them the respondents, may have shown a conduct, some conduct that the court considers disrespectful. I don't know the specific facts, but the impression I'm getting so far is that there were someone or they were to appear before the court and they failed to do. The whole idea of coming to court is the fact that it is not your pleasure. If for someone to appear before the court, it's not your pleasure. You have to be there. You must have very good reasons for not appearing before the court, and those reasons must be communicated to the court. If you are not available to appear before the court, then your counsel or your lawyer may then tell the court the specific reason for your inability to come. And typically, the court may take you on by asking you to find the court with the evidence of the reason why you didn't come to court. It could be you went to hospital, whatever it is. But the long and short is that if there is a summons for you to appear before a court of law, I'm just citing one because contempt is constituted by various conducts. The bottom line is disrespect for the court. That's the bottom line that can be constituted by various conducts, and this is only one. So with regard to them, of course, you may not hear every day these things in the news, but then it just shows you that the court has power. The whole idea of contempt is any form of disrespect, disobedience, whatever, that is shown to a court of law. The court has power and authority to punish you as for contempt. But then the punishment can only take place when you are you are summoned, you are you appear before the court, the charge is laid, and you, the court will give you an opportunity to respond to the particular charge or allegation that has been made against you. So even though you don't hear this every day, it, it just gives you an idea, it just tells you that there are lots of powers that the court has got over everybody in the country, literally everybody in the country, and that it makes them the courts. That is to say, the third estate of, of, the, of, the, of the nation. So, I mean, what's going on, even though it doesn't happen every day, I would say I'm not surprised in the least. It just gives you an idea that there are powers that the court has got over everybody that people may not know. Maybe that's what is making the news. Uh, so in, respect of, in respect of the summons of the court, uh, it would appear that the two gentlemen were not in the know and that at some point they may even have heard of it for the first time in the news or on social media and the rest. Uh, how does the court react in these incidents, especially if the people have not directly or personally been served or if there is proof that they were not in the know? What then happens? Well, you know, what is happening now is that what the court has issued is a summons or an order for their arrest to be brought to before the court. And the reason why they have to be brought before the court is for the charge of contempt or whatever allegation for which reason the court made order for it to be laid formally. And if indeed it is their case that they were unaware of court proceedings and so forth and so on, 
that will form part of their defense or will form their defense before the court. And please, I'd like you to appreciate that these orders are not regularly made. And therefore, for them even to claim that they were not aware, they would, I'm, I'm not sure our judges issue such orders just, just for that, for the sake of it. I am certain, even though I've not seen, based on the way our courts I mean, conduct business, that the judge may have some form of evidence before it to form a prima facie case. In other words, to form a case sufficiently strong for the judge to make the order that he made, which would be that evidence possibly of a bailiff having served certain processes, maybe hearing notices on them to appear on a specific day and so forth and so on. And that is, I mean, because this, with due respect, are not light orders that court make. I mean, court make these orders based on serious evidence. But of course, since Ghanaians are what we are, if they come and they can demonstrate to the court the specific allegation that is made against them, if they can make a case that it is not so, the court is constituted by human beings like you and I, even though they are judges. They will look at the evidence, and it is the evidence that will come before the court that will form the basis of any defense that they may have. And obviously, if the judge reviews the evidence, for instance, comes to the conclusion, as you're saying, that maybe they were not aware, why not? A judge is a judge, and he will do what he has to do. In other words, he will discharge them. But maybe, for all that they are saying, there will be evidence before the court that will be incriminating sufficiently strong enough to form a basis for the allegation that they were aware of the proceedings and failed to attend the court. And if they did, Maybe to be a better defense for them to say, maybe whatever they will be able to say, maybe there was a class, maybe they were on their way, maybe whatever. But there will have to be a valid defense before the court. But please, let me also make this point that sometimes I notice that our judges, once in a while, because the kind of thing that is happening is a very regular, it's a very regular feature of how things happen in our courts. Most of these uniform policemen, even especially soldiers, they don't even think that there are laws in this country that affect them, and therefore they treat the court with slight. So whenever you hear of a judge having made the order, I can assure you that the kind of evidence that the judge has got to make that kind of order will be sufficiently strong enough. But I'll put it this way. The judge is still not... Uh, obliged at the end of the day, still not compelled to commit the person to a term of prison. You could be cautioned and so forth and so on. But whenever you hear of such an order, it demonstrates the judge's anger, if I may put it that way, in quotes. I mean, the judge's frustration, the judge's whatever of the conduct of the police, in this case, the particular officers. Right. That, that, whose, whose names have been mentioned. Right. It just demonstrates. I can give an. I, I can tell you that a judge who makes that order it doesn't make it. I mean, out of sight. He does it based on very strong evidence that would warrant making such an order. So mm. that's the way I, I will look at. It, even so, though so, I've not seen the evidence. Right. Uh, the, the judge will definitely not take this lightly. Uh, hold for me, no. uh, So Let me bring in uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu. Super. So look at the, the, the storyline. Yesterday, counsel for the application, Abraham Arthur, actually pushed for this. Uh, you know, the committal of um, the CID boss and the director general of legal and prosecution stating specifically that uh, there had been an order for the inspector general of police to order the director general of the CID uh, and the director general of the legal and prosecution unit of the Ghana Police Service to appear before the court, which was yesterday, and that was about the third occasion, now that the orders had been uh, carried out by the respondents, but the, they were not in court. And then the justice of the court, Lydia Osei Mafu, uh, also goes on to talk about the fact that no one is above the law and that uh, they, they have to, you know, appear before the court. What then does this do in terms of and like has been mentioned, the Ghana Police Service is on a part of the executive and the courts, of course, a part of the judiciary. What does this do in terms of the, the executive judiciary uh, arrangement or relationship? 
how can it be made better in this particular instance? Thank you very much. I will be very surprised that the Director General of CID and the Director General, the Director Legal, will violate a directive from the Inspector General of Police and by extension fail to appear before a court of competent jurisdiction that has demanded that they appear. I will be very surprised. That notwithstanding, even it is very clear also that probably the processes that they were supposed to be served with to enable them to appear before court were not served on them in person. Because I know if you are talking about contempt, it's personal. You cannot hold the Ghana Police Service or you cannot hold the Criminal Investigation Department for contempt. But you can hold the Commissioner CID or you can hold the Director General Legal. So if the Commissioner CID was held for contempt, and for that matter, he comes to proof that I wasn't served. I've, I've known in, on several occasions that somebody comes to the police headquarters and says, I am looking for the chief. And you get into an office and there is a chief in charge of the office. And they say, this is the chief. And he says, this is a, a message from the court. And I want you to sign. And the man signs. And he's actually not the person who's supposed to be served. Before he goes through the process to get to the real person who's supposed to be served, probably it takes about a day or two. And if the person was supposed to report to the court on that particular day, of course, the judge would be very angry that the person failed to report. But probably it is just administrative bureaucracies that have resulted in these things. I am saying, if every process was full... But, 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 and, but Peter Lanshini Tobu, let me just clarify. You say it could be administrative, you know, bottlenecks that have led to this. It could be. But, but look at the, the, the situation. On March 19, the court held that it was satisfied for the second time. In fact, that was the second time that the notice of application for the two to appear before the court had been brought, and then the IGP was served. Then the third occasion happened. Three occasions of the court reaching out to the IGP, you know, seeking that the two be directed to appear before the court. I mean, what sort of bottlenecks could, you know, result in this on three occasions? That, that justifies the anger of the judge. And as my lawyer, my lawyer friend said, look, no judge will give such an order for, for, for issue a warrant for you to be arrested if the person hasn't gotten to the, 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 the elastic limit. So the truth is that let's allow the police to appear and to defend themselves and let them appreciate the fact that nobody in this country is above the law. The relationship between the executive and the judiciary and even the legislature is so important that we have to live in a in community intertwined, respecting each other's roles and ensuring that checks and balances are so well respected by all of us so that this nation built on democratic principles can progress. So let's allow it to, to slide and then we wait for them to appear before the court and we see how the story rolls out. If, if it is confirmed that these gentlemen, and I'll go to Kweku Penso on that matter from the legal standpoint, but from the standpoint of the police, if it is confirmed that they were duly served and refused blatantly, as, as has been used, uh, to appear before the court, are there internal structures for maybe, for example, bringing the name of the police service into disrepute on these matters? How are they handled within the, the nucleus of the police service? Yeah, as I started saying, even the violation of the directive from the Inspector General of Police alone is enough for caution to the point that they even added that you, you refuse to take instructions from the Inspector General of Police, and you even refuse to, to, to go by a court order, then what kind of police officer are you? Which law governs your activities? Because whatever it is, you can never refuse directly from the Inspector General of Police. And you don't have any legal basis to say, when the court directs, you will not comply. You cannot. So both ways, you actually brought the name of the police service into disrepute. That is, if they failed to prove that they were really not in line with all the procedures to enable them to appear before court. Hold for me, Peter Tobu. Um, coming to you, Kweku Painso, what could be the consequences of these actions? Yes, they are high-ranking police officers, but yes, they also fall under the ambit of the 1992 Constitution. No one is above the law. What could be the consequences from the least to the highest or the worst uh, if, if it is proven that they intentionally, blatantly refused the orders of the court? The court will have power. You know, this power of the contempt, power to punish for contempt, is derived from common law, which means that in Ghana we don't have a statute. In other words, we don't have a law made by parliament 
on contempt as, as part of our laws. So it's been derived from the common law, even though there are traces of it in the in our uh, statutes and whatever. There's no one comprehensive law that prescribes, for instance, punishment and stuff like that. But what our judges have been doing is that they base themselves on the common law principles. And what it means is that when you are guilty of contempt, we say contempt is quasi-criminal. In other words, it's in the nature of a criminal offense. And what it means is But, but it is technically you know, not a crime. It is technically not, but it partakes of the nature of a crime. So we say it's quasi-criminal. And what it means is that I will talk about the experience of punishment for contempt. I have had a client who was jailed six months. It was totally unbelievable for contempt in a matrimonial course. Six months. It's the power that is reserved to the judges. And a judge can... But, but just confirm, what, did the person serve the sentence? The six months? He served the entire se sentence. And if we're interested, it's the kind of sentence he... We've got a sentence which we call uh, the judge has put the key in your pocket, which is typically an order that requires you to reverse a certain state of affairs. In that particular case, my client had been guilty of taking a wife's car. To say much more. I mean, the surprising part was a matrimonial course. Taking a wife's car, going to have an accident with it, failing to repair it and whatever. So the judge sentenced him and said that any time that he's able to restore the car to the hair, the, from the very day, the sentence will end. And he could not. So he spent all the six months in prison. So I've had that person explain of a clan who was just six months. I'm talking about six months for matrimonial matter. And, of course, it was a disobedience to the court proceedings. Then, of course, at the lower the end, the judge can caution and discharge you. So in between these two is there is everything at the judge's discretion. Judge can sentence you to a fine, he can sentence you to an imprisonment, he can do both and so forth and so on. And that is the fate of these police or these police officers when they are convicted. But typically in the nature of state matters and whatever, if the judge even finds them guilty of contempt, I have my read out if the judge will be willing to sentence them to a term of prison. It's very likely to be a caution and a discharge if okay. the judge even finds them guilty. I, my gut feeling tells me so based on the experience with the handling of our police officers and soldiers and so forth and so on. I wouldn't say they belong to a different category of law, but I can talk of our experience about how our judges would normally treat matters of contempt involving the security services. That's my personal view. Gentlemen, uh, we're so grateful for your time. Kweku Painso is a lawyer, and we also had a superintendent retire. Can I just Peter have 30 minutes? Just 30 seconds of the time. 30 seconds. Okay, go ahead. Go Thank ahead. you so much. You know, I would be very surprised even if the Director General of CID appears before court and at the end of the day he's cautioned and discharged. That alone is an indictment. I know you, wait, wait. You, you will be surprised if he is cautioned and discharged? I would expect him to be just uh, acquitted at the charge to show that, in fact, he was not, she was not wrong. Because she's cautioned on this charge. It means that she actually did something untoward. And at the top of the criminal investigation department, the criminal justice system can be affected if the relationship between the police and the judiciary is not good enough. For the director general of police to appear before court and be cautioned and discharged is an indictment on the Ghana, on the whole of the Ghana police service, and she's likely to lose her appointment. The president can decide to take her out. But, but, you can't disrespect the court. If and the court, court, court finds him guilty, guilty. How if the, the court finds him guilty, the court will not deliberately leave him or her because he's a policeman. I mean, to say that is an indictment on our legal system itself. He don't be just left free because he's a policeman or whatever. The only way the court can act judiciary is to rely on the evidence and, like I said, caution and discharge. A judge cannot throw away the evidence because you're a policeman or a soldier. No, the court will never do that. Okay, so Unless the evidence does not fit. Gentlemen, so the hope, what? the hope is that the, the evidence will be enough for her to be acquitted. And I wouldn't say so, thing. but I'm saying that on the basis of the assumption that the evidence is laid before the court and the court finds acceptable, the court will do what the law requires the court to do. There, okay, there's so no gentlemen. law that requires a judge to ignore evidence 
because of somebody's position. No way, it can't no. be. Gentlemen, we'll leave, we'll leave the court to take care of the matter. Whether Thank you. the person will be <laughs> cautioned and discharged, which would come with some tainting or acquitted and discharged, we'll leave the court. Uh, to settle those matters. But, uh, Dr. Pinto, thank you so much for joining the conversation. He's a lawyer. Superintendent retired uh, Peter Lanchini at Tobu is also, uh, well, a former police officer, and he's a member of parliament as well. When we return shortly, we're going to focus on that crucial issue. Now, the PURC has been communicating with the Electricity Company of Ghana on a number of matters, including putting out a load shedding timetable, at least in some context. Things have come to a head, and now the PURC is calling for uh, jail time for Samuel Dubik Mahama, the, the boss of the ECG, together with other board members, about eight of them uh, put together. But we're going to be finding out why exactly push has come to shove. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And persecution of the Ghana. Welcome back on the AM show. Section 2.3 of the last communication between the PURC and the ECG stipulated a number of things. We've got to the point now where the, the ECG uh, boss, together with eight members of the board, are being pointed at and could face uh, some prosecution. Well, we get into that matter uh, this morning together with Kwame Jantua, a lawyer and energy expert. Mr. Jantua, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Good morning. Good morning to your listeners. Right. Um, I'm sure you followed the communication between the, the PURC and the ECG, uh, which has come now to, to a head. Uh, what do you make of the interaction? Because some say it has been frosty over the last few weeks and over a month. Let's start from there before we get into the details of what is happening now. I really don't understand it. Eh? I don't understand how two major stakeholders in our electricity um, uh, uh, production are at the head. It, 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 it makes a nonsense of it, so far as I'm concerned. Because they should be able to work together. They should be. But maybe it's the politics. It's the politics that has gotten into it. Because PURC, who is a regulator, ECG, who's a distributor, should have a good relationship, and this shouldn't really be played in public. There must be an understanding somewhere. And, and that Maybe. is what is mind-boggling, because, like you said, they are like, you know, sisters or brothers, and Siamese they are fighting twins. in the open. It's an open fight. Siamese twins. What is causing them to fight in public? What is it? Mm. The regulator is PURC. The technical regulator for PURC is Energy Commission. ECG is a distributor. ECG distributes electricity from grid co no, transmission. No, grid co transmission takes it from the generator, the VRAs of this world, and the like. So, why should there be this spat in public? I don't understand it if it's not because there is politics in there somewhere. Now, looking at it, PURC, where is their source? Yeah. They are not under the Ministry of Energy, are they? They are under the presidency. And if they are under the presidency, they would take their instructions, if for nothing at all, from the presidency. Their responsibility is to advise the president on all energy matters. And when they go, when there's something happening, when there's shortage of fuel, there's shortage of feedstock, they go to the president and say, we are short of feedstock here. We would need to be able to get probably uh, crude in, light crude in, to be able to power X, Y, Z generators because we don't have enough gas. Give us the authority to do it. And that is where they get the authority from. So if ECG is, is, it has used certain amounts of money to procure fuel, is that ECG's responsibility? Who gave them that responsibility to do? And if you look at the, the, um, 
the writer that uh, the, the fine that has come is got to do with the handling of the cash waterfall mechanism. Right. That's where it is. Now, when you look at the PWC's report on the cash waterfall mechanism, certain things weren't put right. Certain things weren't put in place. On this cash waterfall mechanism, there was a meeting, I think somewhere in February, with the president, the vice president, and stakeholders, where ECG, to my understanding, indicated that there were certain generation plants who went under this cash waterfall mechanism, and they needed to make sure that they were under the cash waterfall mechanism. So, from my information, instructions were given to PRC, go and streamline this cash waterfall mechanism so that it covers everybody. But what went wrong? What went wrong? I, I, I find it difficult. To, I find it very difficult. As, we as, as, as have, do I. We definitely, we definitely have... Look, the challenges we are going through has got to do with finance, has got to do with uh, feedstock, has got to do with maintenance, has got to do with debt. These four areas are the challenges that we are facing. Why can't we sort it out? Why can't we? And now they brought a fine out. So far as I can see, PRC doesn't want a situation where a finger is pointed at them that they didn't follow the law. You brought out a, 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 a mandate for ECG to, to follow. They didn't follow. And this is what the law says. So they are going by their regulatory powers. However, they are under the presidency. And I expect, and if it doesn't happen, I will be so surprised that things will be called to order. The amount of money we're talking there is no chicken feed. 5.8 million? 5.8 million Ghana CDs. But, but a quick a one, even before I get to the practicality of, uh, you know, I, I do know, correct me, uh, if memory serves, uh, the board chair resigned recently, right? It's one of the ECG's uh, uh, board chair, if, if it isn't one of those institutions. And, and this service, it's up till about March the 18th, those who had served on the board up till from March first, the 18th. From 1st January to March the 18th. It, okay, right. But, but the first question about purchasing fuel, um, the ECG, as I have listened to them in the past, have, have made mention of the fact that that was done on the back of some agreements with the finance ministry. Who was the finance minister then? That is why I'm saying to you, uh, Benjamin, that <laughs> the politics playing in there is creating the challenges we are facing. Mm. Because I don't see how Samuel Dubik Mahama would on his own volution do these things if he's not instructed. I know Dubik. Instructed he's a by whom? Person and he speaks his mind. Instructed by whom? He is no. there <laughs> as, as boss of the ECG to act on behalf of the state, on behalf of the president. The president put him there to, to do the right thing and to go by the letter of the law. So on behalf of whom uh, would he be taking these actions? But who, who, who put him there? It, it, that instruction could, should have come from somewhere. And as I was saying, I don't think Mahama, Dubik Mahama will, on his own volition, decide I'm going to use X amount of money to buy fuel. Who instructed him? Who? Was it the Minister of Finance then? Was it Ken Oforiata then? Who instructed him? And the sad thing is that nobody wants to come clear. The only one I see who has come clear is the Gridco. Gridco letter. Non-compliance with loan management instructions from the National System Control Center. That letter, when you read it, it tells you the challenge. To tell you the challenge. So why aren't they being open to us? Is it because they decided sometime 2015, 2016 to, 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 to brand a particular government that they were incompetent and useless because of doing so? Is that the reason why they cannot also tell us that, look, we are going through, if not full doom so, we are going through some partial doom so? Can they not say that because of politics? And because of politics, people are suffering? It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't. Come out clearly. 
said, the president should be able to come out and forget whatever you've said in the past. It has happened. You can't change it. But where we are today, we need to make sure that power is working. We need to. So if we're going through a problem, bring it out. Let's talk about it. Be transparent. Be accountable to it. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. We should stop this kind of politics we play, especially with energy. I would have even thought where we are today, our government will come out and say, look, energy is a national issue. It's not a party issue. It's not a political issue. It's a national issue. Let's bring our heads together and see how we sort this thing out once and for all. When they came in 2016, 2017, we were under IMF. They made it categorically clear that IMF ain't going there again. Did they make it a national issue for us to discuss how not to go there again? We are there now. Now, energy is a national issue. Why can't we sit as political parties, party in power, opposition, sit around the table and say, this particular issue has haunted us since this fourth republic. There needs to be a stop to it. How do we stop it? Let's all put our heads together and stop it because... Whatever government comes in, we have recognized that we get doomsaw, some degree of doomsaw. Even erratic supply of power spoils people's equipment. So we are not serving the Ghanaian right. So let's try as much as possible to put things in place and serve the Ghanaian right. Those are the ones who vote us into power, and we are here to serve them. So let's try our possible best to bring a solution that is long-lasting, that we don't go back in here. No, we're pre politics. Doesn't make sense. The the cash waterfall mechanism uh, bit. Wow. You've you've already spoken about that. Are you one of those who are of the opinion that the ECG has co committed very flagrant uh, abuse of the system? I have listened to Samuel Dubik Mahama in the past talk about fulfilling uh, what they have to fulfill, at least to some extent, paying the IPPs and all of that. The PURC disagrees. Where do you stand on that? Before we come to uh, come back to the substantive sums when you, involved. When you look at the PWC report in review of the cash waterfall mechanism, they talk about discrepancy, declarations versus uh, dis, um, disbursement. And what they observed there, there are certain things that ECG weren't able to do. If you read it, if you have time, I can read it for you. And based on that, ECG hasn't been too clear with the cash waterfall mechanism. They haven't been. And this is why I think the president calls all stakeholders to come together and see how we sort this out. What happened to that engagement? What was the result of that engagement? Because PRC was supposed to um, streamline it. Did that happen? And if that happened, what was the result? Definitely. Certain uh, 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 generation plants, well, they, they've divided into tier one, tier two. Some tier one haven't got their payment, but majority of them have. When you come to tier two, the Minister of Finance is supposed to pay a certain quantum of money to some of the tier two uh, 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 operators. I think this grid code has not been paid. You see? Benjamin, we should put this entire thing in context because of the fact that we are now under IMF. We should be able to sit down and put it in context because the energy sector is draining a lot of the finances we have in this country. And if we are not prepared to sit and talk and play politics with it, how are we going to resolve it? The cash waterfall mechanism was put in place because before they, the government could see that they weren't distributing the collections and revenue to the other stakeholders properly. So this was put in place for that to happen. Why do we now have a stem with it again? Why? And nobody wants to talk about it. The president doesn't want to take responsibility and talk about it. Yes, he has called them, but what is happening? A lot of people last night slept in darkness with this heat. And you think that is fair? A lot of people wore crampled clothes to work this morning. Is it fair? And you come back to us. They are coming back to us in this election to vote for who we feel can run this economy. 
coming back to beg us and you don't want to serve us? You don't want to serve us with information? Just give information. I remember during uh, 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 the last uh, doomsaw, uh, President Mohammed's time, right. there was somebody... Look, look. In, uh, Ramadan, uh, uh, if, if, if you could just hold on to that thought for me before you go back in time, just briefly, I'll be right back to you. Let's bring in uh, former power minister, Kwabna Donko. He joins the conversation. Uh, thank you so much for joining the conversation, sir. Thank you. It's, it's good to have you. Now, uh, I, I know you've been sharing some of your reflections on these developments, but the latest coming through of the PURC uh, saying that the, the ECG boss, together with eight members of the board, are going to have to personally pay for uh, some of these directives that have been flouted and that there could even be a jail term in consequence for Samuel Dubik Mahama. Uh, what's your reflection on that? Well, I'm excited by that. I'm excited because when a regulator begins to bite, a regulator begins to play um, his role as a regulator, then the politi you can keep the politicians out of it. The biggest challenge in governance for this country has been regulatory failure. And therefore, that is why I'm excited. Board members, and it is so important, must understand that they take responsibility. They don't just take certain allowances, etc. But they take responsibility, and so it is appropriate. It is right that the board members be personally held liable for flouting the uh, directives of the regulator. My only issue is with the quantum. And for me, even if they are fined ten thousand CDs each, uh, it will still serve the purpose the purpose that incorporate governance, the board is ultimately responsible. And not somebody sitting anywhere in Jubilee or anywhere uh, directing or in any ministry directing that instructions or directives from regulators should not be um, honest. And that is my excitement. I want to see a lot of our regulatory bodies play their role. When they play their role, uh, politicians will concentrate on policy so that the regular interference will not happen. So and, you, I, you, and that is the basis of my excitement. You feel it is a win for corporate governance, but like you said, the sum of money involved 5.8 million Ghana cities. Where are uh, these board members, and that is not to say that they are more mobra or they may not be capable, but in terms of their work and then the sums of money and the economy where it is, I mean, is that practical? It is. They have a right to appeal. Mm. They have a right to appeal. And I believe if they appeal, um, they may have a reduction, uh, a considerable reduction. For me, the principle is so important. Until now, every blame has been put on the managing director. But the managing director only implements decisions of the board. And so when the board is collectively held responsible, it is a step in the right direction. They can appeal, and when they appeal, I believe that the quantum can be reduced considerably. It is the principle. Even if they are fined a thousand CDs each, it goes on record that the board is ultimately responsible for the uh, flouting of the directives of the regulator. That is so important. So it's about the and signaling. I, the it's, it is for you. State enterprise, mm. I, I am excited that board membership will no longer be uh, a token of political appreciation, but that board members will actually work. I see. So for you, the signaling is, is important. Um, in there, the nine-member board, we have the eight, then we have Deputy Energy Minister Herbert Crapper, uh, but he won't be affected as his tenure, from what we gather, falls outside 
the period of the regulatory orders. Precisely. Kelly Precisely. Gadekpo, who resigned as board chair some three weeks ago, uh, will also be affected, technically uh, uh, speaking. Uh, and then there is the case of Samuel Dubik Mahama, uh, and then Majority Chief Whip Frank Anodompre, and six other individuals making up uh, the, the number who have to cough up this fine. Without which not, there could even be jail time uh, for some of them, from what we gather, up to about two years, especially for the, the boss of the ECG, Samuel Dubik Mahama. This, this is a very serious business, but from where you sit, what are you hoping? It's not just about the signaling in, in governance. When a signal is sent, it must result in something. What eventually should this result in for all these institutions, especially uh, those working in the public sector? Hello, uh, Dr. Kwabnadonko, are you with me? Dr. Kwabnadonko, are you with me? Okay, it may appear that we may have lost, we may have lost him. Um, we'll try to reconnect with him because of the rains as well. The connections are not the best uh, they can be. Let me throw that same question to Kwame Jantua. Uh, Dr. Donko has spoken about signaling. Do you feel this does enough in terms of signaling? The sum involved, is it practical? And what does this do for the public service? Remember, remember, Benjamin, remember that initially this was going to be charged to ECG. Right. But PURC indicated that because of the financial situation ECG finds itself, they've transferred it to the board. Really? Yes, but that's why I'm asking, you, is it practical? These are individuals. Look at the economic well, times. The fact, the fact that they've been able to transfer it means that there could be a solution to it from the presidency. Remember the that presidency. PURC comes under the presidency. And I believe, if for nothing at all, huh, the president can, if he wants, he can call all the sides together and sort this out. And maybe, maybe it might end up in a very small fine just to make sure that PURC isn't embarrassed. When because you say really, the PURC isn't think, embarrassed, what, what do you mean? I mean, in terms of, they, they have indicated to ECG that because you didn't go according to the rules and regulations, we are fining you X. And if it so happens that the presidency decides that mm -mm, this thing is a no-go, but to, 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 make it, to make it look as if, no, to make it seem that you have executed what it is that you had put forward, let's reduce the fine to a nominal figure. It is possible that can happen. Or it could happen that they will eradicate it and find a way to sort this mess up. Sort this mess out. So I don't really see this happen. I don't really see the board members paying this amount of money. I will eat humble pie if it happens. But I don't see it. Because really and truly, in as much as PURC are trying to execute you know, their mandate, I don't see in the life of me why it should get to this. I don't see it. I really don't see it. Because when you speak to ECG, they say they work well with PRC. When you speak to PRC, they say, oh, we work well with ECG. So why this part? Look, if you permit me, if you permit me, let me read what the, 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 the Pricewaterhouse report says on the cash waterfall mechanism. It says, and I quote, we observe that the declared collections and corresponding allocations made by ECG were consistently different from what was actually paid. This, according to the CWM reports, were due to overpayments and underpayments to beneficiaries classified as Tier 2, Level B of CWM. So how did the overpayments and underpayments come about? How? What created it? What brought it in? Why were some overpaid and some, not, uh, 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 some were underpaid? Did they not have the right amounts of money that was owed? 
So what created that particular situation? It goes on to say, the CWM report does not state clearly why this happened. And the PRC notes that the CWM Standing Committee indicated how this defeats the purpose of the CWM. Right. We generally agree uh, with uh, this position. Quite, quite me down to I, uh, just to, my apologies once more for interjecting, because uh, Dr. Kwabna Donko's connection is not that stable. He's back. Let me just take him briefly, and then I'll wrap with you, and we're gone. Dr. Donko, so you were making a point I missed. Your final words on this matter. What's the way forward? Point is for regulatory bodies to be up to their task, and see why in this instance deserves to be applauded for having the courage to do what is right for both the industry and for consumers. The most important, I mean, that. Dr. Donko, we're still then, struggling to hear you. I don't know whether you could reposition yourself briefly and just go back to the start of your yeah. comment. I know is it's it better network. now? It is better. Please start again. Yes. I'm saying that this is extremely good for corporate governance. This is extremely good for regulatory bodies. Regulatory bodies, whether in the natural resource space or in other areas must be up and doing. PUSC, by this thing, has indicated that regulatory body can buy. I want to, however, put on record that the current managing director of ECG has done a human's job in terms of collection. In terms of collection, I must put that on record. And I will also uh, advise the board of ECG to appeal against the party and I believe um, when the appeal decision will be taken, the fine is yes on the high side for individuals. And I like the fact that PUSC said they couldn't from corporate funds. If they were paying from corporate resources, it would mean you and I will be paying the fine. And that is excellent. Uh, we want to see more of this by importantly okay okay take responsibility and thank you so much thank you uh, dr kovnadonko for joining the the conversation he's a former power minister uh lawyer kwami Dantua, we have just less than a minute if you could squeeze your final submissions into 30 seconds so, be so they went to parliament was it last saturday mm. parliament says bring out a timetable PURC has said bring up a bring a town table. Why haven't ECG brought it out? I don't think it's, it's EDC's power not to bring it out. There must be some strings pulling somewhere. Because I know Dupik Mahama, he is a straight-laced person. And if he feels it is what he has to do, he will do it. Somebody is pulling the string somewhere. And we need to be able to identify why that is so. Because it doesn't make sense to any of us. Thank you very much, uh, Kwame Jantua, for having joined uh, the conversation. Sweetie Abochi, so uh, here we are, this yeah. uh, power situation, timetable, and now it has culminated in this uh, trade-off between the ECG and the PURC. Any, it's like any washing your dirty linen in public, huh? I've been following the stories, and I think that, uh, would it be feasible? Would this sanction see the light of day? Would mm. they actually pay this almost six million um, Ghana cities? And if they fail to, will they actually serve their jail term? But I yeah. want to also just say, extend my condolences to the families of those two individuals that lost their lives during the Kuleju Festival. But I will tell you shortly about um, the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel. Before that, I want to wish Happy birthday to Mrs. Adelaide Efua Kwachi of New Fadama. She turns 80 today. Happy birthday from your grandchildren and children. They say they love you and cherish you dearly. Happy birthday. And uh, from Paul, our sound engineer at the Multimedia Group, mm. uh, this is happy and blessed birthday to you, Minister uh, Rachel Akoto, wishing you the very best in all your endeavors. Happy birthday. Well, before, okay, let's look at our photo of the day from the Caleb Mensa. While we put that up for, oh, there it is. That's our photo of the day. Ah, yeah, this is very real. 
I don't know what you see. I see a regular life on the streets of Accra. But while you take a look at that, let me tell you about the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel. Escape to Royal uh, Cozy Hills Hotel. That is the Jirapa Dubai. You've seen the rest. Now it's time to see the best. So take a break from work and take a break from the south. The Royal Cozy Hills Hotel is the place to relax, rewind, and re-energize. It is away from the stress of the south. Now, this is what awaits you. One unforgettable safari experience, amazing array of wildlife, including lions, hippopotamus, zebras, ostriches, among many others, using their spacious and well-secured game tour vehicles and other quad bikes. You're also in for a treat with water sports, such as jet skiing, boats or canoe rides, etc. And there are various family games to keep you and your family excited every single day. So great tourist attractions in the Upper West region, including the Mushroom Rock, Slave Caves, and many more. So escape from the south, escape to the north, and escape to the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel. That is the Jirapa Dubai for an unforgettable safari experience. Call them on 050-169-4280 or 024-8844463 for reservations and further inquiries. And that's how we're wrapping up for the AM show today, Tuesday, 16th of April, 2024. Well, we love you. We're grateful that you've taken the time to join us. Joy News Desk is up next. You want to stay for that.